um, thank you for joining us. Um, those of you who um, joined us before will recall that we're using the webinar version of Zoom. So um, you can only see the commission and some staff members on the, uh, on the screen. Everyone else is in attendee mode. If you are here as an applicant tonight, um, we will um, elevate you so that you can participate with the commission when your application comes up on the agenda. If you are here just to observe, then you will be observing. Um, please refrain from using um, the chat or the Q&A for any items that are closed. Um, and then um, just the commissioners themselves, just, uh, you know, either speak up or raise your hand, but be cognizant of what others are doing, please. Okay, great. And as always, use your name. Um, okay, roll yeah. call. John Goodwin, I am here. John Chris. Here. Krista Nielsen. She is here. Krista, we, okay. Uh, Dan Radman. Here. Claire Tiscornia. She She's absent. Oh, for the sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, Claire. Claire. Right, I, I got it. I got it. Um, Ken Turner. Here. Dick Ward. Here. Okay, Phil Williams is not here tonight. Arthur Cassavant. Here. Chris Herring. Here. James Bash. Here. Okay, super. Uh, Mr. Herring, you are seated for Ms. Discornia, and Mr. Bash, you are seated for Mr. Williams for um, the public hearing, the regular meeting. Um, 711 Silver Mine has been withdrawn. So if anybody is here on 711 Silver Mine, that has been withdrawn. Okay, we're going to start with a presentation. Francis Pickering is executive director of West Cog. Um, Francis um, has, has been a huge help to the planning and zoning chairman group uh, that I've told you about. Um, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, working on and giving feedback on the, the legislation and the various versions of legislation. So I thought it would be great to have Francis on. Francis, if you can remind us um, of what West Cog does, give us a quick, back, quick, quick background on your background. And then if you can outline the legislation and tell us mm -hmm. what's important to us uh, on the commission. Floor is yours. Happy to do so. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. I'm pleased to be here. Um, West Cog, the Western Connecticut Council of Governments, is um, an 18 member uh, body set up under state law. We serve 18 municipalities from Stanford through, uh, sorry, Greenwich through Westport and up to New, Mil New Milford and Sherman. I'm the executive director and I've been there since 2015. Uh, one of our roles is we uh, provide referral service for uh, municipalities in the region. So whenever a uh, a proposal comes to you for a uh, zoning map amendment, zoning regulation change, or subdivision ordinance change, or a change to your POCD that may affect property within 500 feet of a town line that comes to the COG for review. Um, I am joining you tonight from the beach, so I apologize for pacing around. The noceums are eating me alive, and I have no air conditioning in my house. So that's my explanation for the location. Um, we did work very closely with the Planning and Zoning Commission chairs. It was a like to have John on our committee um, to go through all the various iterations of housing proposals and zoning reform proposals we saw this last legislative session. Most of them, like uh, any legislative initiatives, did not make it to the finish line. Uh, there are lots of ideas proposed and that fall by the wayside over the course of the session. Not every idea is a good one, and there's a only limited appetite to every year and, and bandwidth to pass new concepts. So what did pass this year is Public Act 21-29. It was known as House Bill 6107. And the bill does a number of things uh, with respect to zoning reform and housing. And I did send a presentation to Lynn. I don't have the ability to share it right now, but I'll just talk about a few key points. Francis, I'm in the um, opening yep. it right now for you. So just keep talking. Okay, great. Right. So uh, 2129, the presentation I sent out um, includes links to the actual text of the bill, as well as uh, the, the legislative analysis from the Office of Legislative Research. Um, what the, the bill does, I, I can't cover everything in the time I have allotted, um, but I'll, I'll touch on the, the highlights. Um, it makes some changes to the development review process in terms of fees and what you can and cannot do. Not really that important because uh, by and large, municipalities already have used consultants for technical review. 
Uh, it does put into effect required biannual training for PZC members and require certification of ZEOs. Um, that's not really a huge deal. It's probably, it's probably good to have. Um, it requires planning and zoning commissions not to discriminate in decision making uh, so that you cannot discriminate on the basis of immutable characteristics. That is a little bit um, unclear. I, I, I would assume that planning and zoning commissions in Connecticut already uh, do not discriminate on this basis, but immutable characteristics is not defined in state law. So we may see some questions about that potential litigation in the future. Uh, for instance, um, uh, marital status is mutable, but it's a protected class. So the language used there is a bit questionable. Um, perhaps the legislative fix in the future to replace immutable characteristics with protected classes um, oh, uh, should be in order. Um, what may be more interesting to you and was talked about more uh, in the public square this year uh, was a couple of other things. One is redefinition of character. And um, claims were made that character has been used to discriminate in the past. We have not been able to find um, many, if any, court cases where character was used in a discriminatory intent. So in our view, it's really a non-issue, a red herring of sorts. Um, but the law has been changed um, so that uh, zoning regulations uh, may no longer consider the character of a district. Instead, uh, they must give reasonable consideration as to the physical site characteristics of the district. Um, and applications may not be denied on the basis of a district's character unless such character is expressly articulated in such regulations by clear and explicit uh, physical standards for site work and structures. So um, that means if you do care about character, you may want to revisit your, um, your uh, zoning regulations to define exactly what character is in physical terms. Um, this doesn't take away your authority in terms of the appropriate use of land, protecting agriculture, addressing soil erosion and sediment control, protection of existing and public, uh, potential public service and ground drinking water. Um, and in fact, um, uh, Public Act 2129 expands your authority in some very important areas. So uh, zoning uh, now explicitly shall protect historic, tribal, cultural, and environmental resources. This was not, you may have done that in the past, but it was not specifically called out. Um, and you, uh, zoning regulations shall also consider the impact of permitted land uses on contiguous municipalities and on the planning region. So there is some actual expansion of your commission's authority in um, Public Act 2129 that really was not mentioned in the public discussion. And you may want to take a look at that and see if, if you would be interested in amending your regulations to uh, cover that. Um, there are some areas where your authority has been hemmed in or it is you are given more specific direction, specifically with respect to housing. I'll get to that in a, in a minute, um, but um, while we're talking about expansion of zoning authority, um, Public Act 2129 puts into statute um, a court decision from 1969. So floating zones, overlay zones, and planned development districts are now explicitly statutorily provided for. So again, more flexibility, good things. Um, 2129 also empowers municipalities environmentally. So again, this was not really discussed in uh, the, the, the public debate, but it's in the law. Um, historically, or up until now, coastal municipalities um, have been required to give reasonable consideration for restoration and protection of the ecosystem and habitat of Long Island Sound in their zoning and be designed to address environmental issues in Long Island Sound. And uh, furthermore, to consider the environmental impact on Long Island Sound of any proposal for development. This, these requirements and powers have now been extended to every municipality that sits on or borders a navigable waterway that leads into Long Island Sound. And uh, there is a definition of navigable waterway in state law. Um, generally speaking, uh, if you can float a canoe or a kayak down the river at any time during the year or down a stream, it's considered navigable. So there is, I, I don't know all the waterways in New Canaan, but it is uh, conceivable that these Long Island Sound requirements and new powers would apply to your zoning. And you may uh, need to uh, consider amending your zoning to account for that. Uh, Public Act 2129 also endows municipalities with new options in sustainable development. Uh, historically, so up until now, um, the Zoning Enabling Act has provided for um, uh, solar and other renewable forms of energy 
and energy conservation as an option. So you can um, uh, promote those. You now have the option to require those of development. Um, so you can require the use of distributed generation or freestanding solar wind and other renewable forms of energy, combine heat and power and energy conservation. Some of this may intrude on the building code. I don't know how that would be arbitrated if you have this new power and it infringes on the building code, but there's a lot you can do from um, sub, how, how property subdivided um, from, from the outside of the building, how the building massing, um, location of windows, roof, coloration, et cetera, that can be addressed through this. So you have a real opportunity to, degree, to green your zoning, address climate change, and improve electric resilience through this. Um, additionally, uh, state law has enabled zoning to provide incentives for passive solar in subdivisions. Public Act 2129 massively expands this to allow you to provide incentives. And they, they give a couple of examples of incentives, but it's a, including but not limited to. So you have wide discretion in the incentives you may give um, uh, to any type of development. And it's not limited to passive solar anymore, but includes solar and other renewable forms of energy, combined heat and power, water conservation, including demand offsets and energy conservation techniques. So you could use this for instance, for um, to require energy efficient landscaping, um, potentially to require uh, fixtures that are energy efficient that may again wade into building code area but it is provided for in zoning it could be quite important in southwestern connecticut given the uh, water supply challenges we have um, zoning has historically enabled cluster development um, public act 2129 now allows you to require cluster development if you so desire um, so that's another opportunity for your zoning or your subdivision ordinances so we look at this as very positive. You have a lot more authority to green your zoning if you're interested in doing so. Um, and this has not been discussed, as I said, much. On the flip side, what you may have heard about is new parking requirements. So a cap on required parking, uh, one space per studio or one bedroom unit, two spaces uh, for all units of two or more bedrooms. This applies to all residences in all zones. Uh, it does not contemplate visitor parking However, it only speaks to parking that is tied to a residential use. So if the visitor parking is associated with a clubhouse or um, it's associated with a mixed use development, the commercial aspect, it would not actually cap you. Um, we understand there may be some challenge that some developments may require more parking that's provided for. And so if you do not feel this will work for you, you do have the option to opt out if your commission and your town council or legislative body uh, both uh, passed by a supermajority of two thirds and have a public hearing and notice and a record of decision um, with an explanation of why you're doing this. You can opt out. You can opt out until uh, December 30th, 2022. After that point, you lose the ability to opt out. And that applies on a municipal wide basis. Housing, of course, is the crux of this bill. And there's a lot in it. Um, what hasn't been discussed much and that what I find very important is that zoning must now address significant disparities in housing needs and access to educational, occupational, and other opportunities. It must affirmatively further the purposes of the Federal Fair Housing Act. Um, it must expressly allow for housing to meet the needs identified in the state consolidated plan for housing and community development and, and state POCD. Historically, this was encouraged, not expressly allow for. So that small wording change is actually quite significant. In addition, um, zoning may no longer uh, be used to prevent overcrowding and undue population concentration. Um, on a side that you may, uh, an aspect you may appreciate is the affordable housing plan that you are required to complete by 2022 in which um, if you're participating, the COG is doing for your municipality um, may be included as part of your plan of conservation and development. So it can be integrated, not a standalone plan. We view that as a very positive development. Affordable housing should be part and parcel of planning and not a separate uh, set aside. Uh, Public Act 2129 prohibits minimum home sizes. They've been illegal since a court decision in 1989, but some municipalities still have them on the books. Not many in Western Connecticut because our, our, our zoning tends to be updated more frequently. Um, Number of other provisions, mobile homes are to be treated the same as uh, any manufactured home. Um, and then of course we get to 
probably the most substantial change in housing, which is accessory apartments. Um, something municipalities in the region pushed for and we got uh, in the bill and in the law now, the public act, is not to have accessory apartments count against uh, the 10% threshold. So being the denominator under 830G. And the reason for that is that very few, if any homeowners will voluntarily deed restrict an accessory apartment. Um, and because it almost never happens, if ever, um, that was added um, there. Um, so that's a positive. However, that only applies to apartments that are permitted or built uh, from January 1st, 2022. So if, if you have a, apartments that you know are coming online or that whose approvals have to be renewed, uh, there may be uh, some advantage to issuing a temporary approval and then making it final or permanent in 2022 so it's not counted against you. Accessory apartments, um, building an accessory apartment, um, which is what we call an ADU now, um, will not trigger a septic system being treated as a community sewerage system. Um, so that has significant implications for the cost uh, that a homeowner um, might have to uh, confront in building an accessory apartment. It doesn't affect the fact that the, the septic system still has to have the capacity for the number of bedrooms in the single family home plus the accessory apartment. And then uh, last and perhaps not least, accessory apartments statewide are now provided for by right. Um, and there are a lot of details in my presentation. Um, make a long story short, um, there, a municipality must allow them by right unless the municipality opts out. The opt out provisions are the same as for the parking cap. But an important detail in the um, by right accessory apartment provisions are that a municipality must only allow them by right in designated locations or districts. So it's not town wide. A municipality can say we'll allow them by right in certain areas and conform to the statute without having to opt out. There are a lot of specifications about uh, what uh, must be uh, allowed by right under zoning to be in compliance with the law. Um, a home size of uh, a thousand square feet or 30% of the principal dwelling unit, um, dimensional requirements and other zoning requirements that don't exceed those of the principal dwelling unit. You can be more permissive if you want, of course. Um, provisions requiring a familial relationship uh, with the, the resident of the principal dwelling unit, minimum age, renewals, uh, et cetera. Those are no longer permissible, um, but there are also protections um, this, none of these uh, provisions override the state building code. You still can limit the use of ADUs or accessory apartments for short-term rentals or vacation stays. Um, and if you have, if the accessory apartments on well or a septic system, requirements for that may also apply. Uh, the, the law lays out an approval process, 65 day turnaround. Um, and again, as I mentioned, the opt out, you have to opt out the same as for parking, separate, but the same uh, by December, uh, 30th, 2022. So essentially, um, that's those are the contours of the law. There are a few other things such as allowing cottage food operations in residential zones and establishing a committee in Connecticut's future um, that probably aren't as significant. Um, but those are more or less the contours of the law. And I'm happy to entertain any questions you may have. Questions for uh, Francis. <laughs> Well, I, I guess I would just make the comment that it looks like you know, we're going to have to have someone take mm -hmm. a close look at our zoning regulations and see which pieces are going to have to be adjusted to now comply. Absolutely. So a lot of municipalities, um, you know, I've talked to a few. Some say, well, the regulations with respect to parking don't work for us because we have station areas where on-street parking is very limited and these numbers aren't realistic. And the accessory apartments were very concerned about density in certain locations that are already very dense. And um, what they may be failing to see is that there's a lot besides that in there that a municipality can't actually opt out of. Um, so it really behooves municipality to look at the entirety of the act and compare it to their zoning and see where there, where there may be some discrepancies or deviation and uh, try to bring it back into harmony. Because as we all know, these things could be used uh, procedurally or in litigation against municipality. Hey, uh, Francis, do all ADUs 
count towards the numerator in the A30G calculation? No. So that the problem with ADUs or accessory apartments was um, under H30G, if they are deed restricted, they count towards the numerator. But there are very, very few of those. So what the law does is says for ADUs from uh, per permitted or built from January 1st, 2022, those don't count towards the denominator. However, they do continue to count towards the numerator if they are deed restricted. But I'm not aware of any deed restricted because there's there's no incentive for a property owner to do so. Okay. John Cruz here. Uh, if, if you all have developed any um, suggested language to uh, address some of these issues uh, in zoning laws, uh, as well as any preferred language for potential opt out. Um, uh, action. Um, I, I would find it helpful to be able to look at those. I have no interest in reinventing any wheels here. So what we've recommended to date is a couple things. We will be continuing to work with the Planning and Zoning Commission chairs as a, as a peer exchange to share information among municipalities because we're all facing the same challenges with this public act. Um, there, there are two issues. The opt-out is one. Um, the law does require a decisional record, an explanation of why there's an opt-out. And um, I believe it's foreseeable that that could be used against a municipality if it's not a rational and empirical basis. So it really behooves municipality to approach that very carefully and um, build a really good case about why they're opting out. Um, with the respect to the other aspects, some of these are new mandates. Um, some are broader, such as affirmative, affirmatively furthering the Fair Housing Act. Some are more narrow, such as uh, cottage food. And then, of course, there are the new powers, such as sustainability and, and green zoning. And the latter don't have to be addressed immediately because it's, it's just a new authority. You don't have to use it. But the ones that are mandates, you do have to address. So, Francis, for uh, what you know of New Canaan, which you, you know pretty well, mm -hmm. Um, your, your point is clear and I agree with it. We really need to compare our regs to the entire act. That said, if there were two things that you think we should um, prioritize, what would they be? Um, well, I, I think <laughs> what I would say is that um, housing seems to be a more or less perennial issue. Um, and I don't know if we're gonna see the same level of um, engagement uh, whether the engagement was actual grassroots or astroturf, I don't know if we're going to see the same level next year. I have reason to believe, and you may have seen in the press, but I have reason to believe that we may not have the same leadership in that arena uh, next year as we had this year. Right. However, um, I would definitely recommend, since you have a clock for the opt-out, um, making a determination about whether you are going to opt-out and getting underway on building the, the most ironclad case you can if you do opt out. And you may not need to opt out. Um, and the second issue I would look at is, um, since you already are, or through Westcog, we're working on um, an 830J plan. Um, I think that a lot of that will help address the new requirements for uh, zoning to um, deal with affordable housing issues. So I, I think really housing should be at the top of it because that's where a lot of the public attention is right now. Yeah. Um, over the long term, um, zoning in Connecticut has been, it, it's evolved, but it really hasn't done much in terms of sustainability. Um, and we, when you build a house or a building, tilt up commercial space may last 12 years or 15 years, but houses have a very long lifespan and you're baking in um, environmental costs and household costs for decades. And so I think it's really important to start looking at these things again and say, you know, we're building the new Canaan of 50 or 75 years from now, right now. Um, and we know the way we've been building, maybe not personally new Canaan, but where I live, a uh, brand new subdivision of 94 homes went in and they clear cut the entire property the drainage is a disaster. It's causing flooding. And the none of the homes have proper solar orientation. It was a parcel where they could have rotated all the homes to have proper solar orientation, proper fenestration, proper overhangs, 
shading with deciduous trees. And you know those homes will have monumental air conditioning bells. Um, I moved eight houses away. Um, one, the house I live in now is generally 15 degrees cool than outdoors. When I lived in before, it's 15 degrees warmer. And when we're talking about decades of energy costs, it's, it's huge. So I, I would say longer term, greening the zoning is probably a positive approach. That's fantastic. Uh, commissioners, any uh, one last question, if anybody has one? Okay. Uh, Francis, this was phenomenal. Um, I assume we can have you back in the future. It, um, anytime. And um, if you ever uh, need to contact me with a question, I sometimes I am busy, but um, uh, you can always uh, reach me at F Pickering. That's F as in Francis Pickering at westcog.org. Okay, that's great. Thank you again. Avoid those gnats and, and thank you for everything you're doing for us. My pleasure and you're welcome. Have okay, a good night. Take care yourself. Okay, uh, let's go into uh, public hearing item number one, 711 Silver Mine was withdrawn as I previously announced. So let's go to item number two, 684 Valley Road upon application, Mary C and Michael J. Franco owners for a special permit approval of sections 34C6 to allow an accessory structure in the front yard the one and a half story barn to be located within 150 feet of second front yard on Turner Hill Road in the two acre zone at 684 Valley Road. Who is here to present, please? Mr. Franco, Mrs. Franco. Lynn, they're on mute. Can you hear us now? We hear you now. <clears throat> yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mike and Mary Franco here. Our application is to um, construct a barn on the Turner Hill side of our property. Um, it is uh, called the front yard, but it's actually the side yard of our property. Our property faces Valley Road. Um, yeah. So you can see from the survey where we do are classified as having two front yards and we have a short driveway on Turner Hill Road and we have a, a, our main driveway is on Valley Road and we have a two car garage underneath our house. Um, but we would like, you know, we've always wanted to have an accessory uh, garage barn um, that we could keep things in storage uh, and also just for the architectural aspect of it. For fun, the yard used to have a lot of uh, structures and barns in it historically, we provided a, an historical document for you guys. Um, it's small, it's about a story and a half. It doesn't have running water or heat or it has electricity for lights inside, but um, it's basically a storage barn and just sort of for fun. Our house, I, I, again, we provided some documentation in the file, but our house, the original structure is one of the oldest in uh, homes in New Canaan. In fact, if you ever look at one of the uh, very old New Canaan maps, you'll see a little, you know, square on our piece of property because it's uh, it dates pretty far back uh, in the history of town. We and we've renovated it and tried to keep it in keeping as much as we can with the um, original, you know, date and time and fixtures and so forth. The old side, which is closest to Turner Hill Road, is the original structure, a 35 by 35 foot uh, box. And we added on to that in 2004 uh, for the rest of the property. Talk about this. The, the barn is, I believe, 762 feet. I thought it was 672, 672 square feet. Yeah. I have dyslexia. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, and. Uh, that's it. If there are questions, uh, we'd love to answer them. Questions, commissioners, questions for the applicant, please. This is John Chris. I have a question. Uh, is there existing an existing foundation? No. Uh, for the barn? Yes. No. So there would be a cement slab is going to be the yes. foundation? Yes. Could you, could, could you also talk about the materials you plan to use for the sides of the barn that would be visible as well as the roof? It would be a traditional old barn wood wood sides. Um, it would be a traditional old, in keeping with the year of the original house, the barn doors would be the sliding barn doors. Um, and there would be one uh, side door to get into the sort of, if you wanted to walk in rather than opening 
the barn doors. So it's wood, it would have a little cupola on the top with a light in it. And it would have, um, <clears throat> it would have the, what do you call the thing? The, the hay baler arm. Or the hay door up top. Yeah. And the, uh, we'd have traditional cross box on the barn doors. And again, they're sliding doors, not electric. And, uh, you know, we're trying to make it as visually pleasing as possible. And there are many other barns on Valley Road. It's an old farming road. And uh, we think it would fit in great in on the street and in the neighborhood. And the roof? A traditional, you know, an asphalt, architectural asphalt shingle. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, um, Lynn, uh, would anybody from the public like to address this application, please? If anyone wants to speak from the public, could you just raise your hand on this application? Mr. Chairman, there's no one raising their hand. Okay, Mr. And Mrs. Franco, thank you very much. This application is closed. Thank you, Mr. Um, Chairman. You. You're welcome. Item number three, uh, 208 Valley Road, 143 Valley Road, 225 Valley Road. Upon application, Michael Sweeney and Jason Klein, Carmody, Torrance, Sandak, authorized agents for Silver Hill Hospital owners for a special permit approval of sections 32C18, 64G1, 64G2, to allow for landscape and site enhancements on the property, excava excavation grading of more than a thousand cubic yards of earth material to facilitate the aforementioned landscaping and site enhancements and soil disturbance of more than 10,000 square feet in area to facilitate the aforementioned landscaping. And I just said that in the two acre zone at 28 Valley Road and 143 Valley Road and 225 Valley Road. Who's here to present, please? Hold on a second. I'm, um, Michael Sweeney's joining you. Okay. Michael Sweeney, please remind me of the name of your um, land of the landscape architect, Mr. Gould. Lynn, his name is Mr. Goldie. Robert Goldie. Goldie. Robert Goldie. Is he signed in on Mr. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Thank you for raising your hand. Go ahead, please, Mr. Sweeney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Goodwin, uh, members of the commission. <clears throat> My name is Michael Sweeney. I'm a partner with Carmody, Torrance, Sandak, and Hennessy uh, office in Stanford, Connecticut. I'm pleased to be here this evening on behalf of Silver Hill Hospital. Uh, with me this evening is one of my colleagues at Carmody, uh, Jason Klein. Uh, also two experts who have uh, assisted in uh, the materials that have been submitted to the commission as part of this application. Uh, Robert Goldie of Towers Goldie, uh, he prepared, uh, his firm prepared the uh, site plan, uh, plans that you have in front of you, as well as uh, the landscaping plans, which really are the crux of uh, this application. Uh, also with us is uh, Brian Baker of Civil One Engineers. Uh, Mr. Baker's firm prepared uh, the engineering reports that you have, all of which received uh, uh, no commentary from uh, the town departments, uh, no effect on drainage by virtue of this uh, enhancement of landscaping and uh, sidewalks, and certainly no impact on uh, the existing uh, septic systems. Uh, also this evening with us, I can't see if everyone's with us, but a number of the executives and management at uh, Silver Hill Hospital, uh, Dr. Andrew Gerber, he's the president and medical director at Silver Hill, uh, Lisa Benton, chief quality officer, Rick Markello, Chief Financial Officer, and also uh, Peter Percelli, the Director of Safety and Support, uh, all at Silver Hill. I'll just give a brief introduction and then I'll have uh, ask Mr. Goldie to take over, who can uh, better describe the details of the application. Uh, we haven't been in front of you for some time. I was looking, it was 2016 when uh, the Gray House application was submitted, uh, was a pretty smooth application, a lovely building was constructed at that time, there was some enhancements made to uh, the parking layout, some reconfiguration of the roadways uh, for safety purposes, as well as some septic work that was done. So this application really, we see it as a continuation of 
the work that was planned uh, with the Gray House. Uh, there was a disturbance to the front lawn uh, by virtue of uh, the admissions uh, house construction. It's not a particularly attractive uh, lawn. So you'll see, uh, as Mr. Goldie will describe, uh, the enhancement and really a beautification that is really the, um, the nub of this application. Um, you will remember that the, the Silver Hill Hospital is a world-renowned psychiatric hospital. It consists of about 44 acres in the uh, two-acre residential zone. Uh, the campus is bif bifurcated by Valley Road. About half of the campus is on the east side, half on the west side, each about 22 acres plus or minus. Uh, this application largely deals with uh, the west campus. The use is a special permit use. It's a permitted use. Uh, under the regulations under the POCD were classified as an institutional use. Uh, the application, the main theme to our application tonight really is safety and landscaping enhancement. As I mentioned, we see this continuation of the plan that started with uh, the admissions building. Um, the plan in involves hundreds and hundreds of new plantings, uh, trees, uh, a water feature, and uh, I think what's gonna be a lovely uh, wildflower natural lawn that's been designed. One thing that the application does not do, and it, it, it calls for no intensification of the use of Silver Hill. There are no new buildings. And again, uh, no uh, intensification of any programs. This is uh, an outside uh, uh, landscaping uh, application uh, driven by safety and for beautification. Uh, one thing I would mention is probably about eight years ago, in one of the prior applications, Silver Hill set up a liaison group with uh, uh, the neighbors. And periodically the group will meet with uh, representatives at Silver Hill to talk about operations, plans, uh, events that are gonna take place. Uh, also applications well in advance of them being filed. And that was done in this case as well. Uh, Mr. Pacelli had a meeting with the liaison group prior to the filing of the application. And as he relates to me, there were no uh, negative comments that he received and uh, essentially we're all supportive. Um, to my knowledge as well, since the last building was constructed, uh, no complaints have been made uh, of any substance to uh, Silver Hill either directly or that were addressed in the liaison group or particularly to uh, Lynn Burks Avenue as part of her uh, activity uh, in zoning enforcement uh, in the planning office. Uh, I did receive an email yesterday from one of the neighbors on Huckleberry Hill, Sandy Mintz. Uh, I did uh, represent her and promised to her that I would um, uh, relate her comments to the commission this evening. I'll do that a little bit later, but I did want to mention that as well. Uh, I received no comments or calls from any of the neighbors, the dozens of neighbors who received notices. Uh, when I spoke with Lynn this morning, I don't think she had received any either, but there may be, of course, be people here at the meeting or uh, things that happened this afternoon. One final note I'll make is I won't go through all the special permit standards. I think we address them all well in our application. Uh, we comply in my opinion with all the special permit standards that you would look at uh, in considering the application. I suspect you probably don't want me to go through them, each of them one at a time, but if you want me to, uh, please uh, ask me questions and, and we can review them. Um, construction at the site uh, when this, this work is being done will be fenced in, won't be viewable from Valley Road. Uh, all soil and erosion protections will be um, uh, applied during the construction period. There will be no queuing of cars or construction vehicles on Valley Road. Everything will be self-contained uh, within the campus. So with that introduction, uh, I'll pause. If you have any questions of me, uh, I'll uh, give it a go. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Goldie. Why don't we uh, go ahead with Mr. Goldie, please, Mr. Sweeney. Thank you, everybody. Um, again, my name is Bob Goldie, principal with Towers Goldie Landscape Architects in New Haven. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as Michael said, this, uh, this project is basically a, uh, a tail on and a finishing off of the previous project that came before you uh, at Silver Hill, which was the uh, what's now called the Ackerman Center. It's the admissions and uh, administration building in the uh, seen in the lower uh, left-hand corner of this plan. At that time uh, that the building was constructed, 
a, uh, a number of vehicular improvements were made to the campus and parking was added. Um, but the pedestrian environment was left pretty much the way it had been. So this project is all about improving the pedestrian environment. That's uh, on the, the end of safety, on accessibility, um, and also in, just in terms of allowing the patients and visitors and staff to uh, get out into the landscape and take advantage of this beautiful uh, area that they have that's been created by this loop drive that was constructed uh, for four or five years ago. Um, and really to, to enhance the landscape in that sector to, to provide a focus for this campus. So what you see here is um, that, that circular loop drive and virtually the entirety of this uh, project that's before you now with the exception of a few connections to other uh, pedestrian connections to other buildings uh, and areas of the campus but virtually all of the work we're, we're proposing is inside that loop and it's a series of walkways and landscaping next slide please so this is an engineering drawing that was uh, was provided. Um, it's, it's the, all of these are in the, the package that was submitted, um, but it, it more clearly shows uh, the in, in heavy lines, the road improvements that have been completed. And then in lighter uh, lines, the, the walkways that are proposed through the center of this campus. Um, this is actually an erosion and sediment control plan that shows uh, where we're intending to put uh, sediment control uh, features, uh, stock stockpilings, topsoil, that sort of stuff. Next slide, please. Um, one of the aspects of the previous project that had been done was actually an improvement to the septic system uh, on several buildings in campus, in this campus. You'll see it in the, the, the blue lines here. Um, both on the, to the, to the left-hand side of the, the meadow and to the right as well. In constructing those septic systems, virtually this entire meadow area, this entire lawn was ripped up. The topsoil was stripped. Um, the, uh, not only the septic system was improved, but drain lines were added as part of that project. And that drainage, uh, which handled all of the additional parking and, and drives, was also uh, anticipated at that time, the inclusion of these walks as part of the uh, contributing area to the drainage. So, and, and I believe you've seen the uh, drainage report that was submitted that uh, verifies that this additional amount of walkway is easily handled by the previously constructed drainage improvements on the campus. Next slide, please. So this slide sort of um, uh, illustrates one of the issues, or actually two of the issues that uh, we're trying to address. First is of the obvious condition of this lawn. Um, it had not been uh, properly uh, re-landscaped or, or, or seeded uh, because it anticipated this project coming along. Um, it needs additional topsoil. And furthermore, uh, what you see here as a uh, sort of a herd path is the sort of desire line for uh, patients and staff through this central space. There are no walks there now. We'd like to give them a walk to go on and make it a little more interesting than a direct straight line that you see here and that exists today. Next slide. So in essence, this, uh, this image illustrates um, what we're trying to get at here. We're trying to create a series of landscape spaces, a, a sequence as, as one walks through the campus to really enhance the beauty of the, the, this beautiful bu bucolic campus that, that uses their landscape as part of their therapy. So this is the view uh, from Valley Road looking in towards what's called the main house across this meadow area. Um, we would in, improve the, the landscaping on both sides improve the crosswalk that exists um, at the intersection of both uh, access drives to the campus on either side of Valley Road. And uh, 
Next slide. <clears throat> the next uh, slide illustrates how, as you walk into the center of this space, the intent is that you be surrounded by a wildflower meadow. So that is the sort of central focus of this space. We are trying to get away from a manicured lawn and get towards a more a naturalistic and uh, we think more beautiful um, changing landscape uh, as you go through the summer with, uh, with various wildflowers blooming at different times. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So a little more detail uh, on the actual proposed improvements. This is, a, this is our layout plan, again, part of the package. Um, what it shows is uh, asphalt walkways. The walkways in general are five feet wide. We wanted to keep them as, as narrow as we could. We didn't want this to become all walkways. The intent is to keep them as narrow as we could, but still allow for the adequate uh, tra pedestrian traffic through the space. Um, you'll, you'll notice to the upper right corner, the box that is shown there is really uh, uh, an enlargement that I'll get to in a minute. That is an area where we're, we're, we'd like to locate a, a lawn terrace as sort of an overlook or a prospect so that it, it would provide the first outdoor space for patients, staff, visitors to use to be outside either as part of their therapy or per perhaps with visiting uh, relatives, uh, provide some private areas for, for people to sit and talk. So this space doesn't exist today. There's no real place to, use, to, to be able to sit and enjoy this central open space on campus. That's what this creating this outdoor uh, terrace, this lawn terrace is all about. It is connected towards the, uh, the main house with a set of stairs that will be built um, so that it sits more or less mid slope between the drop off of the drive that, that exists today and the meadow itself. So you'll be able to look out over the meadow uh, towards the distant views. Next, please. In terms of grading, what we tried to do is to lay out the walkway alignments, number one, to be interesting and curvilinear, but also to work with the topography that's out there. So by and large, we're just sort of cuffing this uh, walkway into the existing terrain that's there. We wanted to provide as much accessibility as possible so that all the spaces that are being planned are going to be accessible um, so that uh, required certain amount of, of grading. And then again, because we're uh, planning on this space, this uh, uh, lawn terrace between the main house and the meadow itself, that area will need to be lifted up with, with the fill. So the, the most amount of uh, earthwork on the site will happen at that location. Next, please. In terms of planting, uh, as Michael pointed out, uh, we're providing a, a quite a robust planting plan. Again, the intent is to augment the landscape that, that exists. So we're working with the palette that exists on, on the campus, most of which is native material, um, but we're using it in, a, again, a more naturalistic fashion. We are prevent uh, planting quite an, a, a, a robust buffer, uh, which will enhance the trees along Valley Road right now. Um, if you remember back when the uh, last application was in, there was a parking, uh, an additional parking strip added between uh, the meadow and Valley Road. That area, which has trees in it, will be reinforced with planting, again, naturalistic, uh, mixture of, of trees and shrubs. Uh, the trees would be both flowering trees and, and uh, shade trees. The most intense planting is proposed at the actual uh, terrace, the overlook terrace, for obvious reasons. That's where people are going to, uh, to stay for a while. Um, and so we wanted to enrich that, create a, a welcoming space around it. 
uh, the vegetation on the meadow side of that, that uh, uh, area is going to be lower with the exception of the shade trees that one would look underneath. But it, we wanted to actually enhance the views with, with the uh, proposed planting in that area. The next, next slide, please. <clears throat> So this is a blow up, the upper uh, right hand corner is a blow up of the planting in that um, lawn terrace area, um, showing quite a mixture of, of plant material. Again, mostly native material, but there are going to be some flowering uh, shrubs and, and trees for interest. The other segments that you see on this drawing are the, the interstitial connections that will complete the pedestrian path system so that all of the buildings on campus have an adequate pedestrian connection to this space and through the campus. Much of which um, either doesn't exist today or uh, exists in, a, in an unimproved condition. Next slide, please. So again, uh, the whole point of this is to create an enhanced landscape and to provide an enhanced safety for the pedestrians. We've taken care of the vehicular traffic previously. This is really about pedestrians. Next slide, please. Again, as you walk in, up towards this, uh, this uh, prospect lawn terrace, the idea is that the, the planting becomes enriched. You can see the water feature the water feature that is there for not only visual, but for sound as well, to give some additional amount of quieting uh, to the people who are using this space. And I will say that um, there's a lot of interest in, on the part of, of Silver Hill about using this space uh, for therapy, whether it's group or individual therapy. Um, again, this type of space in this general location doesn't exist today. The next slide. Another view of the Overlook Terrace. Um, on the opposite side of the uh, sloped walk, we will need stairs. The, the grades get uh, a bit steeper. Um, so we have stairs. And as I mentioned that there will be stairs that connect this terrace directly up to the, the stairs that go from the drive directly into the main house, the original building on campus. Next. So again, this is a sort of an aerial view of this, uh, this lawn terrace um, showing the, the intent here, an enriched landscape tucked back away from the road, overlooking uh, in a beautiful uh, wildflower meadow. And that pretty much encompasses everything I wanted to, to say. Um, Michael, I don't know if uh, the engineer has any comments I don't think right yet, uh, Bob. I think we can turn it back uh, for any questions at this point. Commissioner's yeah. questions for the applicant? Question. Mr. Ward. Yeah, uh, Dick Ward, uh, you mentioned the water feature. What, what is the source of the water and is there an estimated amount of water consumption that would be used? It's a recirculating fountain. It's, uh, it's only about 10 inches deep. Uh, there will be a, a well, a recirculating uh, trough to get the, the pump and the mechanical equipment. But we're trying to use the absolute minimum amount of water that we need to get the effect. Um, I, I Honestly, I don't have offhand the uh, volume of water, but uh, in terms of depth, it's limited to about 10 inches. Thank you. Uh, Hi, uh, James Bash. Um, it, it looks like the, the project is going to lead to a lot of significant improvements. Um, but a question that uh, had more to do with the short term impact of the excavation and the construction of the project um, and the level of disturbance it might cause to residents or neighbors. So can you talk a little bit more about um, for example, for ex excavation, what the duration of excavation is likely to be, how early in the morning it's likely to start, and then the construction period as well, the potential impacts to residents or neighbors uh, during that phase of the project. 
Um, is Peter Porcelli on, on the call? He, Peter has uh, is overseeing the actual construction. Hi, yes. Okay. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, so the, the construction hours were, were scheduled for uh, 8 until 4.30 p.m., Monday through Friday. We won't be doing any work on the weekends. Um, the schedule, and we're expecting this uh, job to take about six months to complete. Um, we're generally, we're, you know, that's where we're, that's the timeline that we're looking at. And um, it's a quite a big job, as you can see, and it's going to take just about that amount of time to complete it. Okay, and has there been any concerns or feedback expressed from uh, people who live on abutting properties about the level of noise that might be created by the project? I have not received any complaints or concerns about that. I don't know if any, anyone else has uh, called in or written in about that. Thank you. Mr. Chris. Um, John Chris here. Um, question for the landscape architect. Could you uh, share with the commission um, some of the choices you made on the plantings in particular, native versus non-native plantings and relative attractiveness to uh, pollinators and other fauna? Well, glad you asked. Um, you know, as I, as I did mention the plant list uh, that we have provided. Um, it is by and large uh, native material. It is not exclusively native material. Um, we are uh, planting shade trees, uh, maples, oaks, uh, no, no ashes, um, primarily maples and oaks, uh, flowering trees, um, amelanchiers, red buds, um, uh, we also have some magnolias, some some um, non-native trees, but by and large, the trees and particularly the shrubs, uh, we typically stick with a uh, close to native palette. Um, I don't know if we could go to the uh, the plant list if you'd like to take a, a deeper look at that. Thank you. Um, it is on the appendix of the presentation. We could go Play 14, I believe it is. What's the sheet number again? Um, it's, it's page 18 of the uh, presentation. That's, that's the index, but there's a... There's I can't a, remember which, uh, which one I, I clicked on. It's on landscaping and hardscaping improvements plan. It's page 18 of that. So it would be... Uh, LA 14, yeah, this drawing number, which would be uh, close to the last one. There we go. I bring this up because uh, I spot checked, uh, well, more than spot checked some of the names and like Periwinkle is European, Norway is from, well, it's kind of obvious. Hydrangea is from Sakhalin Island, China and Japan, Cotton Easter is Siberia and China. I'm wondering why, uh, when there's so many useful native plants that um, local fauna, particularly uh, local uh, pollinators, find useful, and why non-native plants would be used. Well, we are trying to provide a level of interest um, in terms of the sheer quantities. Um, you know, most of the plants are of the, the larger variety. Um, with regards to shrubs, that's where we'd like to add some degree of interest. Um, I will say with regard to pollinators, the, one of the main reasons we're interested in planting a meadow, a wildflower meadow, is for that feature, to, to 
attract the pollinators. I, I get that. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> that's, but I, you know, again, the, uh, the selection of plant materials is uh, intended to provide uh, enough interest through the seasons and provide color, um, as well as uh, there are quite a bit of na native plants here. And, and just the question is why uh, such were not uh, prioritized and whether that was an issue you considered in putting together this list. Well, we try to keep a balance of, uh, of, of plants. Um, I, honestly, I do think that there is uh, a balance here of, of native material and, and introduced material. Um, prioritized. Um, again, if, if you look at where we're using plants, uh, the most uh, intensive planting around the, the terraces or where people are gonna sit or where we're proposing the, the most amount of shrubs. Um, as you get to the outer edges of the, of the planting design, uh, the plant material is, is largely shade trees and, and, and flowering trees that uh, are mostly native. So it's the introduced uh, plants typically are uh, right up against where people are going to be um, milling about and, and wanting to enjoy some, some variety. Another question on the landscaping, will uh, all the stone be natural stone? Yes. yes. Thank you. Ken Turner? Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you, Mr. Turner. Okay. Um, for the record, uh, Kent Turner, 229 Valley Road. I'm a, been a butter to Silver Hill. Um, <clears throat> I uh, find that the, uh, the design, the proposed design is, um, will be a, uh, a welcome addition to the neighborhood. The uh, planting is robust. It um, <clears throat> looks well done. And the uh, feature of a li little bit of a waterfall and uh, area for people to gather um, I think would uh, will will be a, a very nice enhancement. Um, however, the uh, you know the devil's in the details, and that's um, how this thing is constructed. And I think we need uh, a lot more information to better understand uh, just exactly what are the construction logistics, uh, <clears throat> you know, the traffic flows, uh, how many cubic yards of uh, earth is going to be moved or brought in. And, um, you know, <clears throat> details like the wheel washer so that the trucks don't track all the dirt into Valley Road, the safety aspect of truck movements, uh, are you gonna have flagmen? Anyway, I have a series of questions that relate to um, how this actually gets implemented and um, uh, would like to hear from, uh, perhaps it's Mr. Percelli to uh, explain a little more about it. Hello, Mr. Turner. Um, I'm sorry. It was very difficult for me to hear uh, what you were what you were saying. I, you're asking for more information about the, the construction aspect of it and what we're and how we're planning on keeping this place safe and ours. No, I think I'm sorry. It's it's very hard. I'm even having trouble hearing you now. You, can you hear me now? Yeah, can you, can, we can hear you, but if you can turn, if you, there's a way you can turn up your volume, you're not as loud as most of the other speakers. Can you hear me now? I hear you better now. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm having a technical problem here tonight. Um, the um, the hours aren't the issue. It's it's really construction logistics. Um, you know, what's the tr the flow of traffic, the truck movements? Um, how many trucks do you expect on a site? Where do they stage? Um, you know, are, do, are you going to have flagmen to uh, control the movement on and off of Valley Road? Um, will wash? How, are you going to keep the Valley Road clean? Um, are trucks going to idle? Are they going to back up? And I'm going to hear eat, eat, eat 24-7. Um, anyway, if you could 
uh, address some of the construction issues, I would appreciate it. Sure. So there's no, there, we're not planning on having any trucks idling for hours on hand. The, the trucks are going to come in. They're going to go into the main circle area that we identify. Uh, that's where the fencing is going to be up. They're going to come in. They're going to go inside there, you know, take out, you know, dump their loads. Um, they're not going to be backing up and moving around, uh, you know, all times of day. Um, as far as wheel washing goes, the, the, uh, the contractor um, is, is going to be handling uh, things like that. Um, that's not something that I had honestly thought about. So we can certainly talk to them about it and make sure that uh, anything that happens uh, regarding that, they, they maintain that. So there's no dirt and debris going out onto the road. Um, the, as far as flagmen and things of that nature go, we have, you know, security on site here. Um, we also have construction uh, uh, folks that can, that can give us a hand. We're not going to just have anybody barreling out onto onto Valley Road. Um, you know, we're trying to make sure that everything is safe and as safe as can be. Um, so we don't anticipate there being a huge amount of traffic uh, generated from that. They're going to be wheeling things in and, and getting it done. And it's not going to be uh, where they're going to be on Valley Road all day, um, you know, creating a lot of traffic and a lot of problems uh, for the for the residents in the space. How many cubic yards of fill for Cut. Are you going to do? I don't remember the exact uh, amount of cubic yards. It was in the application. Um, do you do you know that, Bob, off the top of your head, or I, if I gave you a number off the top of my head, it'd be wrong. But I, it was over a, a, a thousand. So that's over a hundred trucks. <clears throat> over what period of time? It would be over the course of the, the project, over the course of, you know, six months. But all of that material is not going to take six months to get into the campus. Right. Okay. Could you um, it just kind of uh, inform me as to uh, when a truck arrives at the site, where do they enter and where do they exit? They're going to enter through the main entrance. But there, the there's, more than, there's more than one main entrance. Uh, the, the, the newly made entrance over by the admissions building, which we're okay. categorizing as our main entrance. They're going to come in through there and go right into the, uh, the gated space, the fenced in space. And that's where they're going to uh, do the majority of their work, unload their trucks and dump their materials. And where do they exit? They will exit through the same entrance and exit and go out onto Valley Road through that space. Um, that is um, um, sums up my questions for the moment. Um, again, I think the uh, the design is um, very handsome and uh, will be a nice uh, addition to to the neighborhood if this is done properly. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions? And one follow up question, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. I have, uh, I have one. Okay, Mr. Cruz and then Mr. Casavant. Thank you. Um, on the plants that are being purchased, will any of them uh, be sprayed with neonicotinoids prior to uh, purchase sprayed by the grower? I, no, Nick's. I have never been asked that question. I, <laughs> I assume we could make that a requirement, but I, you're you're way out of my horticultural league here. <laughs> so, can you say that again? Neonicotinoids, it's a um, just spray that's often put on plants. And um, it was actually um, uh, banned by the US government for some public spaces because of harm to pollinators. It's banned, I think, in Europe. Um, Many plants uh, are sprayed with it, um, sort of keep them pretty for sale. I think Home Depot actually will list uh, whether it's been sprayed by that. But um, as a beekeeper, uh, person interested in pollinators, um, I, I can, and the expressed statements on the part of the applicant of wanting to uh, be very green and so forth, whether this would be an aspect of the plants we would be purchasing. Um, I, I appreciate the 
my attention. Um, we'll look into it. Um, I, I honestly, uh, typically plant material is sourced from quite a variety of nurseries. Um, and as landscape architects, we often don't get into that level of review. We can, however, put it as a requirement uh, for the, the material if, if that's something that is deemed necessary. Hmm. They were banned from National Wildlife Refuges as an example. So. Just asking a question. Thank you. You've answered my question. Pass event. Uh, just a quick question. A thousand cubic yards of fill. Has there been any assessment of uh, possible water changes to abutting properties or will the thousand cubic yards simply not affect that water flow? There should be no alteration to the water flow leaving the site. Um, as I mentioned, the, the only area where we're intending to uh, put fill material is that one terrace that's right opposite the main house. That's already, it's an existing slope that's there now. It is not a low spot. The, the low spot in this uh, existing meadow is close to the road and in the center uh, of the, the length, uh, north-south length of the, the meadow. So it, we don't anticipate it affecting the uh, the, the groundwater or the runoff um, at all. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, John, Chris Herring had a question. Sure. Uh, just a question, two questions, um, one on irrigation and, and the second on the crosswalks. So I, I saw, I was looking at the, the site plan review and I did see a note for irrigation to the sodded areas and the, the terrace, I believe. I just wanted to understand, is the, is the meadow going to be irrigated and how does that intensity compare to its current water use? No, with the, the irrigation is being limited to a small strip of, of turf that's gonna be adjacent to the walkway. The meadows themselves are not meant to have any irrigation at all. So it's a matter of, of maintaining that, that turf strip um, adjacent to the walkway. And as you mentioned on the, uh, the terrace, the turf terrace itself. Okay, and then um, I guess lighting in the crosswalk, it, it looked like the bollard lighting that's uh, detailed in the plan is a, um, you know, a dark, scare, dark sky compliant design. Is, is that it, correct? It's actually the existing light standard that was developed for and by the campus. And it's been used extensively on the campus. So we're simply using that fixture. Um, in, in, in new areas. So it's, it's um, essentially replicating the, the light levels that are out there already. It's just increasing them on the walkways. Okay, and are, are, they, are they dark sky compliant or are they just, you know, what they are, you know? It's actually a custom fixture. It's a custom designed fixture and fabricated fixture. Um, if I, it, are they certified to be dark sky compliant? Uh, I'm not certain of that. I, I, Mr. Percelli might know the answer to that, but because it was a custom designed fixture built for and by the campus, I doubt there was any official certification of it. Okay, okay. And then on, on the crosswalk, um, is there, has there been review and safety review? I see just it's going to be striped. Is there going to be any, um, you know, uh, push button strobe or anything to improve the safety on the crosswalk or is that deemed unnecessary? The crosswalk crossing Valley Road was actually part of the initial uh, uh, project and was built at the time that the, the physical striping was built at the time that the intersection was moved and realigned to both sides of the campus. Um, so that was sort of permitted at that time, as I, as I recall, um, there was pushback against um, an activated signal there. So it's basically a, a stop sign for pedestrians in, in, in the walkway and, uh, and, the, and the painting. Okay, um, thank you. I appreciate the answers. That... Uh, so it's James Batchwood, just a follow up question. Um, so given the duration of the work, and it sounds like the construction uh, will consume a lot of daylight hours, 
Um, again, I want to go back to some concerns I have about the level of disturbance, the noise on, uh, on residents, actually. So, you know, it's a mental health facility where you have people that, that are there that want a peaceable environment and they're there because they suffer from anything from depression to psychosis. And so I'm curious what the feedback from the Silver Health staff has been in terms of the, you know, the impact of this extended project consuming most of the hours of the day on uh, how people, um, how residents are experiencing their stay and the impact it might have on residents. I'm not sure if Peter or someone from Silver Hill might be able to uh, field that question. So um, as far as the, as the impact goes, we, we certainly do wanna make sure that we're, we're trying to keep our, our residents and our patients in mind. Um, you know, construction, unfortunately, you know, makes, does, you know, make a lot of noise and it, in order to do things that, um, move the earth and do things like that. It, it, it requires a lot of noise to be made. Um, we're trying to, you know, obviously limit uh, where we can, the, the noise that's that's coming you know, from that. I, I don't know how we can successfully do that all of the time, um, but we're trying to limit, you know, the hours, you know, as we as we start moving along, you know, getting further on into, into the project, um, there'll be, It'll get. It's going to start to get darker. We're not going to have as much uh, daylight. Um, you know, once that happens, we're not going to be able to continue to work uh, as long as possible. Um, as far as impact goes um, from uh, treatment, um, I don't know if um, if there's been any feedback um, to the executive team as far as uh, any any concerns from patients or or residents. Um, but uh, nothing like that has come uh, to my desk or or to me. Okay. I can add a little color to that only from past experience. Uh, uh, there've been some significant construction projects done on site with uh, the K house, with the, the missions building. Um, then all the improvements to the buildings over the years, going back to uh, uh, when Dr. Uh, Ackerman was uh, a CEO and chief medical officer of, of the hospital. I remember posing the question, the same question to him on prior applications. How does, particularly when we did the cell tower, uh, for those of you who lived in town back when the cell tower was constructed, that was done at the request of the town and the neighbors in order to hide the cell tower along the ridge because the neighbors were concerned, uh, albeit the need for the cell tower uh, and that Turner, Ferris Hill, the Valley Road area of town, which had no coverage. Actually, the coverage still gets a little weak as you go further north. Um, but at that point, I remember asking Dr. Ackerman about construction of the cell tower other construction as well. And uh, basically he assuaged any concerns that I raised in connection with any hearings we had then. They say that they're, they're the professionals, they know how to you know, treat the patients and, and how to deal with any disturbance around uh, the campus. And certainly they've done that on all the past applications and all the past construction. Recall that many of these buildings uh, date you know, well back into the last century. And many of them have been upgraded to comply with ADA in current building codes. So there's been a lot of construction going on there over the past uh, 15, 20 years or so. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, uh, Mr. Sweeney, before we open to the public, um, any concluding remarks at your end? No, I think the, uh, the question about the uh, crosswalk, I think by Mr. Herring uh, is well placed. Uh, that was vetted and talked in great detail at the last application. Um, we ran it by the police department, uh, fire marshal, Mr. Baker, I remember looking at it and in keeping with the, the desire to have it be very benign and passive, um, it was decided not to have anything other than a well-marked crosswalk. And I think the uh, determination was made that given the traffic level that everyone felt it was safe so long as it was marked. So um, that was discussed in a lot of detail at the, uh, uh, the Gray House application. Um, I do appreciate the comments made by Mr. Turner, who I think may be sitting on this application, but I'm not certain, um, since he's a, a neighbor of ours. Um, and again, to allay his concerns, the uh, this is certainly like not like one of the $10,000 uh, 
the 10,000 square foot monoliths that we see built around New Canaan nowadays that goes on for 18 months. There'll be a six month project and uh, we give you our assurances that we'll make every effort to keep all the trucks contained on site to use the entrance that we've represented this evening. And certainly Silver Hill will be completely responsive. If we get any questions raised by uh, uh, Ms. Avney uh, uh, about any issue on site, uh, we pledge to address it immediately as Silver Hill has always done in the past. Okay, I think that's all you. I have, Mr. Gilbert. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Lynn, um, would anybody from the public like to address this application? If you'd like to speak from the public, you raise your hand. And um, we do have one person with their hand raised, Alisa Benton. Okay. Okay, I, Ms. Benton. I, I actually am from Silver Hill and my hand was raised before just to speak to the issue of the disruption to the patients, which I appreciate. I appreciate the concern and the thought on that. Um, but my hand was raised to address that just to say, you know, every improvement we make is with them in mind. And we feel that the, that the gains of this project for the therapeutic environment far outweigh the temporary short-term disruption. And, and the staff is all very uh, supportive of this for the patient population. Okay, thank you. Um, Len, anybody else out there? There is no one else, but if anyone else would like to speak, if they would raise their hand. There, there are no hands raised, Mr. Chairman, at all. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. You're all you're all set, I assume, right? I might act, if, if you'll indulge me, there's one other comment I want to make, and it's based upon a promise I made to uh, one of our neighbors in an exchange that we had yesterday and this morning. Um, I see that um, Ms. Uh, Sandy Mintz uh, isn't here tonight, and that's consistent with an email that she sent to me yesterday, which I responded to, and we had a, a email colloquy uh, back and forth, and since she told me that she wouldn't be here tonight, she did ask me to um, uh, relay her remarks to the commission. And uh, although it's a little unusual, I said I would because uh, as you can see from the uh, uh, non-existence of comments from our neighbors, I think we did a pretty good job uh, at reaching out to our neighbors ahead of time and getting comfortable with what was planned here this evening as well as the welcome comments from uh, Mr. Turner this evening. Um, but anyhow, I did get an email from Ms. Mintz yesterday. Um, I'll read through it kind of quickly. Uh, she cannot participate in, in the meeting this evening uh, for the special permit site plan application. That's why I'm sending this to you, Mr. Uh, McSweeney. She has my name wrong, but the property is at 169 Huckleberry Hill Road is where she lives. She abuts the East Campus portion of the hospital. Um, the buildings closest to her house on Huckleberry are the lodge and the building with the swimming pool for frame of reference. She points out to me that trees have died um, over the years of natural death. Apparently there's a wooded area between her house and uh, her campus, I, I assume. Um, trees have died of natural deaths. Wetlands have increased. Uh, abutting properties have felled and removed trees, not our property, abutting properties. It's not as dense as it once was. This is sad, but what is annoying is light emanating from the backs of the East Campus buildings. And what I pointed out to her in a response back or to you this evening is that there's no plans for any work done, being done on that East Campus with additional lighting on buildings. So um, I certainly respect her concern and understand it, but these are existing conditions. So I wrote back to her and said, we're happy to engage with you. I gave her Mr. Porcelli's contact information. Um, she then wrote back to me and said she probably wasn't interested in meeting with Mr. Porcelli, but she did want me to relay this to the commission, which um, again, it looked tad unusual, but I said I would. Um, she, she related that she understands the security reasons to have illumination on the site. Um, uh, she's concerned, concerned about people getting lost in the wetlands and ending up on her property. And she concludes by going forward with the plans you have sent me. I hope you will keep in mind that the bright building lights that shine into the woods near Pointing Brook are annoying and intrusive, especially in the winter months. So I wrote back to her and said, we'd be happy to engage with you. And uh, she then wrote back to me and said, 
uh, please uh, have it noted at today's hearing that I oppose protest requests, less intrusive lights on the backs of the buildings on the East Campus construction, the hospital's planning. And again, we're planning no construction on, on the East Campus. So I wanna make that perfectly clear that uh, everyone understands that. Um, but I did uh, mention to her that um, as we do with all our neighbors, uh, happy to meet with her and see if there's anything that can be done to uh, 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 help her with uh, concerns that she has, but uh, it is separate and apart from the application before you this evening. Um, Got it, understood. Okay, thank you, Mr. McSweeney. Um, that's a joke. Um, this hearing's closed. Item number four, 941 Ponus Ridge Road upon application of Linda Andros owners for a two lot resubdivision of 2.538 acres of property located in the two acre zone at 941 Ponus Ridge Road. Who's here to present please? So Ms. Andros is um, is here. Hello. Hello. We can Ms. hear Andros? you. Can you hear us? We can hear you. Okay. okay. It's uh, Bill Avery. Uh, Husband of Linda Andros and Linda Andros, the property owner at 941 Ponus Ridge. Uh, we want to uh, subdivide our property and carve off uh, a building lot of about 2.5 acres. Um, I think we've uh, submitted all the required engineering reports and surveys. Uh, there's no wetlands on the property. Um, and uh, we look forward to your approval. Okay, um, Mr. Avery, that this is a subdivision. This is not a re-subdivision, is it? Have you pre has this property been previously subdivided? Uh, yeah. I get yes, yes. Well, I, I, slightly yes. Uh, we bought the property at nine fifty five Thomas Ridge, and then um, um, took a little property from that, gave it a little property to make that a building lot, which is now under construction. So I guess this would be a re-subdivision, yes. Okay. Commissioners, questions for the applicant? It's John Kriz. Uh, will all utilities be buried you know, the, uh, we do have a buyer uh, uh, contingent on getting a deed and your approval. Uh, we have met with uh, him and with uh, Eversource and uh, uh, the, the electrical lines are above ground to our property and off of the pole on our property, it'll be underground to his property, yes. He doesn't have a builder yet, but that's his plan. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, <clears throat> this is Chris Herring. Mr. Herring. So my question was, uh, and Lynn, maybe you could help me here. The the lot size is just north of two acres. What is the, the zoning for this area? Two. Four acres. Two acres. Two acres. So two acres on. Two acres zoning. Okay. And the the other piece of property that was carved off is also two acres. Is that right? Uh, okay. The remaining lot would be it's about four four acres. What we're left with on our house. Uh, yes, yeah, so our existing property will be a little over four acres. So. Okay. And the the length of the the, the access point. The length of the driveway is that uh, is it a shared driveway? Uh, no, it's not going to be a shared driveway. It's an access way, and um, you know, I'd have to go to my computer to get you the length. You'll see it there on the um, <coughs> survey. Yep, yep. I'm just looking at the site plan here. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you for those questions. Okay, anybody else? Okay, Lynn, why don't we open this up to the public, please? If anyone wants to speak from the public, could they just uh, raise their hand, please? Mr. Chairman, there is no one here to speak. No one's raised their hand. Okay, super. Uh, this application is closed. Item number 5, 1031 Owen Oak Ridge Road upon application of Amy Zabatakis, Ruchi, Ruchi Law Group authorized agent for Kin Ridge LLC, owners for a special permanent site plan modification approval of section 64G and 34C7 for an accessory building which exceeds 1,000 square feet of building coverage for property in the four acre zone at 1031 Owen Oak Ridge Road. Um, Mrs. Zabatakis, please. Um. Ms. Ms. Abitagas, before you, um, your architect, remind me his name, and could he just raise his hand? Um, Armand DiBiase. There he is. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we have Armand DiBiase is, and, uh, oh, sorry, this is Amy Zabatakis from Ruchi Law Group on behalf of the applicant. Um, I'm joined, um, well, I can't see everyone who's in, in, who is here, but um, Alex and Annie Phillips are the um, individuals who own Kindridge LLC. The architects are Cynthia Filikoff and Armand DiBiase. Um, landscape architects, Catherine Herman and Rebecca Montross, and engineers, Adam Serini from DeAndrea Engineering. Um, so, um, this is actually a modification of a special permit. Um, I'm not sure how many of the current commissioners were sitting on the application back in 2018 when we originally came forward. But um, Lynn, if you can put up the presentation, I can sort of walk through. Sorry, you're still pulling people up. <laughs> yes, you can start talking. I'm pulling it up right now. Okay, so, um, so the original, um, so, Bef prior to 2018, this was two lots with two single family residences and the larger lot was also had a barn and riding facility as well as a pool um, and a office uh, garage structure up near Owen Oak Ridge. The um, original house on Owen Oak Ridge was quite close to the road. Um, in our original application in 2018, we sought to merge the two lots and um, build one single family residence with a barn and equestrian facility. That, that single family residence also had a pool and to retain the office garage structure up near Owen Oak Ridge. Um, that application was approved. Um, we, since that time, the um, owner's vision for the property has changed and um, perhaps importantly, they've decided to home their um, horses on a different property. So it's changed the plans for this property considerably. So the new plan, which is the modification that's before you now, um, does retain that office garage structure um, near Owen Oak. Um, it changes the location of the house. It actually moves it away from the reservoir. Um, it removes the barn structure, removes the riding area. And then as accessory structures has the pool moved further away from the house than the original pool location and um, has a gym and tennis court um, accessory structure. So this, what's on the screen right now is the original prior to any um, work being done. And then the next slide is the approved application. So again, there was extensive regrading um, as part of that uh, prior application um, and which was approved at that time. And then the next slide should be the, um, what we're applying for now. Correct. So those, the um, sort of outlined in orange are the, the new structures. And then you can see down to the lower left-hand side is where the pool is um, and to the right, close to where the old 1077 Owen Oak House was, that's the um, gym and tennis court structure. So, um, and then, then the next slide you'll see is um, 
that, that's the engineer's drawing. The next slide is the, the landscape architect's drawing um, where you can see as well um, some of the new screening along the, the property lines that's, that is being added. And the next slide, Lynn. Yes, I know my, my computer's thinking, sorry. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, well, we can just skip ahead. So basically what I've done from here is, um, right, so that's the, la that's the landscaping plan. And this is all in your packets. So what I did as far as the presentation from here is because this is sort of a large lot and it's hard to see on the screen is tried to show you quadrants. So the first is the, um, I'm just gonna talk, I'm not gonna try to talk North, South, East and West um, because the, it's not set up that way on the um, axis. But so the upper left corner of the property closer to Owen Oak Ridge, which is where the main entrance drive is. Um, that is that that will that curb cut is staying where it is currently and will lead into the parking area at the house. Um, you will notice uh, there's some regrading up um, near that entrance drive, which is actually sort of a landscaping um, structure in that area. Um, the next slide uh, shows the you know, now upper right quadrant. So you can see that retained um, office building, which we had was pre part of the prior approval. Um, the roadway in from the old 1077 Owen Oak driveway, that road, that driveway in remains the same. And then when it enters, this enters into the body of the property, it now splits in two with one drive going down towards where the um, the gym is one drive going towards the house. Um, that little box you see right at the um, fork in the road is a, a shed with a generator in it. And that's in that location. So it's sort of centrally located to the property and an, an easy location for the propane deliveries. Um, so then if you go to the next slide, um, since we've sort of shown you two splits of the house, this is the house. Um, the, Upper view is the west elevation, which is what you would see um, if you're looking at the house. You won't see it this well from the road because this property slopes down dramatically and the house is built into the into the hill. So even this you wouldn't see from the road because of the distance back from the road. Um, and then what you see on the, the slide below, it, which is the south elevation, is looking over towards the parking area. And you can see from this elevation how the um, the, the slope of the land is such that um, the, ho the house is, like I said, is built into the, into the um, slope. And we actually have some open but covered courtyard areas um, looking down towards the reservoir. So it's not three stories, even though from this angle, perhaps it looks a little bit like that, but those are all open areas. The, um, the area where the garage is, is um, actually considered a separate accessory structure um, because it has a um, living area on the second floor. The first floor is the garage area, but it's only connected to house by a porte cochere. Um, and I think that's the first time I've pronounced that correctly. So go me. Um, so your that area is um, considered a separate accessory structure from the, the building itself. And I only mention that because as part of this application, um, it is a modification of the regrading permit that was already granted, but also a special permit for the um, accessory structures over 1000 square feet. And that is the first of the accessory dwellings, not dwellings, accessory structures, I apologize. Um, the next slide, you can see some other views of the house. Again, looking at the house from the reservoir, which is the top view. Um, again, you can see those, um, those covered terrace areas. And then um, from the north elevation, which is um, as if you were coming in from that 1077 driveway, the old 1077 driveway. Um, the next slide is the quadrant with the gym building in it. Um, so again, you can see we have a single story gym building and a, and a tennis court in that area. That gym building would be the second of 1, 000, over 1000 square foot accessory structure. Um, and you can actually see the, on the next slide, the gym itself, um, the views, the elevations of the gym, like I said, a single family structure with um, some garage storage space attached to it. Um, the next slide is the lower left quadrant, which is where the pool and pool house is located. The pool house is under a thousand square feet. So that's not part of the, um, 
accessory structures that require a special permit. Um, and the idea here is that this pool is very close to where the old um, riding ring was. And so that old riding ring area can be turned into a nice flat um, play lawn as, it, as it's being referred to. Um, let's see, and then the next on the next slide, you can see the interior of the and, and elevations of that pool house. Um, you can see it's just a small sitting area with bathrooms. Um, and also on the left-hand side of that slide is actually that um, generator um, hut, which I pointed out at the fork in the driveway. Um, so basically, as uh, there, you have all of the information and we have the engineers on the call if you have any questions for them, but um, you know, the, the drainage report as um, was presented last time, um, no adverse impact on the property, no adverse impact on any of the neighbors. Um, we do have inland wetland approval. We've, we've tried very hard to make sure that we're protecting the wetlands as well as the reservoir. Um, one of the things that had come up in the last application was some concerns from the um, water company representative about protecting that reservoir during construction. Um, and we have incorporated into this plan everything that we had discussed at that time, such as um, double silt fencing during the course of construction for the areas closer to the water. Um, I think the one of the good positives here is that actually there's a lot less happening um, close to the to the reservoir in this new application because the house has been moved um, significantly further up the hill. Um, let's see. And um, let's see. So yeah, so the special permit is under 6.4G for the um, regrading. Um, again, that was granted in the last application, but of course it's modified considerably for the new um, layout. And then under section 3.4C7 for the two new um, accessory structures, which are over a thousand square feet. And as I said, we do still have the, um, the office barn structure that was is was pre-existing before any application was filed and was approved in the last application and as well as the pool house which is less than a thousand square feet um, so that's really a summary of the project um, I wasn't sure I, I, I do have um, as I mentioned all of the relevant experts are available for questions but I thought rather than having every single person go through the application since this is really a modification rather than a new application I might just open it up to questions from the Commission at this point Commissioner's questions Turner? Yes, um, could we revisit the office use? Uh, could you describe it a little more in detail? What uh, <clears throat> what the office is, and it, was it? Uh, I don't. I was part of that uh, hearing. I don't recall uh, the approval for a, a, an office. Um, it, well, it's not a larger permit. Uh, could you clarify that? Yes, so that building, and, and when I say office, I, I don't want it to sound as if I'm talking about a um, commercial office space by any stretch of the imagination. This is a, a home office as opposed, and it's so it's not a dwelling. Um, it's a, um, there's a garage and there's off, office space up there. It's being, you. It will, the plan is for the um, uh, owners to use it for sort of their own space to get away from the rest of the family, for lack of a better word. Um, and the reason that was part in the last application um, that was um, approved as a special permit because it is an accessory structure within 150 feet of the, the front yard. But it was a pre-existing building so that we have not touched. I mean, it's been renovated, but has, was not touched from the um, before any work was done on the property. Okay, I'm just still curious about the number of parking spaces. Um, if it's part of the uh, residence, I, I would imagine they just walk from the main house to, mm -hmm. to the office. Uh, why so many parking spaces? Well, the um, the owners themselves have a few cars as well as um, uh, recreational vehicles. So um, that's the reason that there are excess spaces for for vehicle storage. I don't know that all of them will be used for cars, um, but that is that there's space there for them. Okay. Thank you. This is Kristen Nielsen. I have a, a couple of questions. So I know that we're hearing this application because of um, accessory buildings in excess of a thousand square feet. 
do you know um, what the proposed coverage for all of the buildings that you just discussed is for the site and what the total allowed coverage is for the site? Um, yes, that's on the survey. Um, Adam, do you have those numbers handy in front of you? I think you're muted. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. I see that there. Yep. This was exactly my question. <laughs> In which, okay. of the, right. which of the accessory structures exceed mm -hmm. the 1,000 square feet? I can see your thoughts delineated here as well. Um, my second question is about the water company. Um, you said you're using all the same mitigation strategies to, that were negotiated last time. Have you shown this new plan or revised plan, I should say, to the water company to make sure they're comfortable with this? Yes, um, I, I um, reached out directly to Casey Cordes, who's the um, representative who was um, we spoke with last time. Um, he took a look at it. Um, I followed up with him to see if any comments, and he said he did not. Um, I he, I was hoping I'd actually get so far as to get him to to um, enter in a letter of um, support, but I wasn't able to get him that far. But he did say that he would not be here this evening and didn't have any comments. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? So with the, uh, this is Dan Radman. So with the um, repositioning of the house, the main house, uh, different than the original application where there was a significant amount of um, regrading and uh, new fill and cut fill going on, uh, looks, looks less here. Um, has a cal calculation been done to determine the exact amount of fill that's going to be moved around and is any new fill being brought in or is this all cut and move on site? Um, I believe that it's all cut and move on site, but let me let Adam address that directly. Maybe he'll actually talk this time. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, on, on our development plan, if you want to pull it up or not, it has the calculations on there. It shows how much is being cut, how much is being filled. And we try to balance the site as much as we can. If you look at a cross section of the house um, from the road down to the reservoir, there is some cutting on the high side and some filling on the low side. So it balances out. Um, and there is a net cut, which means there's excess soil. And which what is going to happen is the contractor is going to try to fill or deposit as much of that soil as they can on the site without having to cart it away because that's that's annoying for them. So uh, I see that on your drawing. Um... Uh, looks like you've got uh, a cut of 6,100 cubic yards and a fill of 3,700. So leaving you with an excess of 2,400. What, what exactly are you going to do with the 2,400? So the contractor has two options. They can either take it away, um, see if anyone else would like it, um, or they could find space on this large property to kind of smooth out the slope some more, right? We're showing grading here to limit, uh, to limit the disturbance area. Um, but in reality, a, a lot of the site is going to be disturbed for construction. We're gonna, we're gonna you know, restrain that as much as possible with the silt fence and the construction fence and they can deposit the excess fill on site as needed. Okay. Uh, Ms. Zabatakis, versus the 2018 approval, is is this a net increase or a decrease in coverage? Oh, I don't know that I checked that. Adam, do you know the answer to that? I, I don't know exactly. Um, New Canaan has a specific way of defining coverage um, in the regulations. So there is a little bit more of impervious coverage whether or not that actually counts, um, but we have accounted that for that with the redesigned drainage system. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to pull up the old, um, and I should actually say for the record that I would like the prior, since this is a modification, I think it is, with the prior application included in the record of, of this application. Um, so I'm just trying to pull it up myself to see if I have the actual coverage, the 
survey with the coverage numbers. Actually, yeah, last time it was a net cut. Let's see. More coverages. Yeah, I'm not, well, I don't know that we can answer that question quickly, John, um, but I, I do, as, as Adam pointed out, we were well below coverage previously and now. Okay, okay. Oh, here All we right. go. Uh, No, that's existing. All right. Sorry, All right. I can't find we, it. We, I apologize. Okay. We, we, we can move on. Yeah. Uh, anybody else, commissioners? Okay, Lynn, let's open this up to the public, please. If, if anyone wants to speak from the public on this application, can you please raise your hand? Anybody, Lynn? There are no hands raised. Okay. In that case, this application is closed. Um, item number six, 1171 Valley Road, upon application of Katie Wagner of, Thank you. not going to get this right, Cusited Consulting LLC, authorized agent for Ronald and Lisa Blatt, owners for a special permit, site plan approval of sections 34C3 and A2B for the demo of a non conforming garage and reuse of the existing foundation to create a detached accessory residential structure with one bedroom, one full bathroom, kitchen, study, and laundry room for property in the four acre zone at 1171 Valley Road. Who's here to present, please? Um, Katie, the, um, is that you? Um, Katie Wagner, that's listed as Katie. If it is, can you just raise your hand? Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, my name is Katie Wagner. Um, as you mentioned, I'm here on behalf of the owners, Ronald and Alita Blatt. They currently have a non-conforming garage in their yard, and they would like to use the same foundation in order to create a cottage for their son. Um, because it's non-conforming, we need to come for a special permit application for your approval in order to change it to a residential accessory dwelling. Um, and I think that's about it. That's really what we're asking for here. Okay. Um, Commissioner, questions for the applicant? Uh, Dan Radman here. Um, so the dwelling unit, second floor, um, by the way, whoever you, the architect you used for the drawings, kudos. I haven't seen hand-drawn submission drawings in years. <laughs> um, Very much more detailed. Yeah. Um, so the dwelling unit, is, is that a, just a single bedroom upstairs? Yes. Uh, large, large room on that entire floor? Yep, one bedroom, uh, bathroom. Got yeah. Got it. And is there a site plan that shows um, the driveway and approach to the? I see the survey and it's got sort of a drive noted in there. Is, it, is any of the driveway changing or approach or parking area changing no. uh, relative yeah. to this garage? No. All the parking is the same. It has the existing parking spots on site. Um, in fact, the person that will be there doesn't drive. So, um, so yeah, no, the driveway and all of that is staying the same, all the hardscape. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, John, one question just on the septic. Is the septic called out in terms of how the septics, uh, this is Chris Herring for the record. Is the septic going to be part of the main house's septic? 
The septic will be part of the main house. Um, the health department reviewed it, brought it to the state, the state approved it, um, and actually recommends that it be part of the main dwelling as well. So everything's been approved by the state and the town okay. from that respect. Thank you. Commissioner John Chris, uh, will utilities be underground or above ground? I actually, the contractor is actually on the line. Um, he would know better. Um, Lynn, I don't Katie, know. You... Katie, what is his um, name and can he raise his hand so that I could find him really quickly? Because there's. His name is Don Hoyt and he just texted me. He, he's on the phone. It's all underground. What's his la What's the last four digits of his phone number? Is well, Lynn, we, Lynn, we just got the answer. Okay, that's fine. A further question, um, it will be an, an, an electric kitchen as opposed to maybe a propane tank, propane tank outside or what, what are the, what's the thinking? Let me get back to you. My apologies. Yeah, this is Chris Aaron, a related question just on the, well, the let's, heating. Let's, Eric, yeah. Chris, let's let It's her propane. Okay. So there'll be a propane tank uh, outdoors um, next to the building. Let me see if this will help. I'm gonna call him. Elect hold on. He, now he's changing. Let me call him and get him on the phone with you guys. Um, let's see. I'm sorry. He had called in, but he doesn't know how to get through. Hi. I'm gonna. I'm going to put you on speaker. Hold on. Okay. All right, Don Hoy, you're on with the commission for New Canaan for the special permit. Okay. So uh, the uh, the oven will be electric, and the uh, the only thing outside will be like the Mitsubishi units that are electric for um, the heating and cooling. So no no propane uh, no propane tanks. Okay, so out, outside uh, HVAC units for the for the dwelling are contemplated. Is that a yes? And they're like they they're like one foot wide by three foot. They're really small. They're not traditional um, uh, condenser sized units. Will that be on the uh, close to the road or the? Interior It'll be on the opposite side of the building. So on the, from the road, you can't see it. Thank you. Mr. Aaron. You're on mute. Yep. Just to be clear, it looked like the HVAC was to be determined based on heat gain. And, but I just heard you say, uh, Mr. Hoyt, that you've determined that those will be electric um, split systems, so it'll be an all electric building effectively. Correct. Okay, thank you. And it looks like the the orientation from a a solar gain perspective has been incorporated from a you know a siting perspective. Um, looks like heat gain has been calculated, et cetera. So that looks good. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. Ken Turner. Um, I'd like to uh, congratulate and uh, acknowledge the uh, designer and also the owner for uh, rehabilitating the uh, existing building. It was somewhat of an eyesore. It's uh, a very, very attractive building now. And um, I think that uh, everybody's done a, a great job to bring this old property back. I'll, I'll pass that on to the homeowners. They'll love to hear that. It's been a dream of theirs since they uh, built the uh, newer house on the premises in 2005. Job, job well done. <clears throat> John Chris again, the um, exterior of the building will be um, wood clavards and, or aluminum siding or what are you contemplating? It'll be a uh, wood clapboard and uh, the plan is to make it look exactly like the existing house, like the main house on the property. So it's it's all wood. It'll be a cedar clapboard, and then the um, 
like the corners and all the decorative moldings, we're going to try to match it as close as possible to the existing house. And the, and the roof? The roof will be cedar, just like the existing house. Thank you. And, and currently, it's also cedar right now. Okay. Everybody good? Okay, Lynn, uh, let's check with the public, please. Does anyone want to speak from the public? Mr. Chairman, there are no hands raised at all. Okay, great. Then this application is closed. Um, item number seven, uh, deliberation, possible action. Let's make some decisions. Um, 684 Valley Road. Do I have a motion for approval or denial? Kent Turner, I uh, <clears throat> put forward a motion to approve. And the justification, the reasoning is that uh, the barn uh, will be a nice enhancement. It's uh, in keeping and character with uh, most of the uh, barns on Valley Road. And um, it's actually tucked back from uh, Turner Hill and Valley Road and uh, uh, sited, I think, uh, in a very well, well placed location. And um, I see no reason that um, we should hold up this application and not approve it. Thank you. I second that. Okay. Any uh, further comment on the motion? I think it's a very handsome building in keeping with the uh, agricultural heritage of the town. I, I see the impact on neighbors and on the community as being nothing but positive. Um, I would vote for approval. Okay, great. Okay, I'll call the question. John Goodwin, I vote yes. Uh, Mr. Chris? Yes. Mr. Radman? Yes. Mr. Turner? Yes. Mr. Ward? Yes. Mr. Cassavant? Yes. Mr. Herring? Yes. Mr. Bash? Yes. Ms. Nielsen? Yes. Okay. Motion carries unanimously. Option number, option, <laughs> application <laughs> number three, um, 208 Valley Road, AKA Silver Hill. Do I have a motion for approval or denial? I'll move to approve. Reasons for approval, Mr. Ward? There seem to be going uh, to a great extent to beautify what appears to be a rather rough, unfinished uh, area. Uh, it's the center portion of their campus. They seem to be going uh, to some extent and I assume expense to uh, make it as attractive and pedestrian uh, uh, facility as possible. Uh, the, it's not going to be just a, lo a large lawn, but uh, meadow uh, has a water feature that uh, they say will conserve uh, water. It's not going to be a, a heavy user of water since it just recirculates. So I, I think it's a just a plus for the area. Now, there are some concerns that have been raised about the uh, construction period time and the noise. Uh, neighbors are perhaps uh, properly concerned. I think that they did uh, explain as best as they could to uh, minimize the noise, but construction is construction. The uh, facility, uh, is, is aware of the potential impact on their patients and uh, say that that is something that they uh, are aware of and will handle. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ward. Do I have a second? Chairman, Mr. Turner, Turner um, I uh, would like to second it with um, some formal or reasonable conditions. Go ahead. And um, I think that we need to formalize the uh, uh, constrict construction logistics, um, you know, exactly, um, you know, how the uh, <clears throat> traffic is going to flow, how it's going to work. 
Um, you know, are they going to have flagmen? Uh, is there going to be a wheel wash? Um, I think, you know, in the spirit of everything, we heard that, yes, in fact, uh, they're going to provide these things, but I think we should formalize it in, in the form of a condition. Um, the hours of operation, uh, I heard Monday through Friday, no work on the weekends, and um, that um, there would be uh, staging of all the trucks, uh, construction equipment internal to the site, not on Valley Road. The main entrance would be uh, to the uh, to the south entrance, not the north. And um, the other condition would be, um, uh, let's see. Um, work hours. Well, I think I covered it, but I, I firmly believe that, um, you know, Silver Hill has good intentions. Sometimes, you know, things change, <clears throat> becomes difficult to follow promises, but I think we need uh, a, a few conditions to uh, formalize this to make sure that um, it happens. So, Mr. Turner, what I hear you saying is a con construction plan along the lines of the applicant's testimony. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, Mr. Ward, you moved the motion. Do you accept that as a condition? Yes, absolutely. Okay, any, any other discussion of the motion? Mr. Chris? Yeah, yes. Um, well, I, I think the idea of uh, putting uh, enhanced plantings is a, a generally good idea. And I understand the um, therapeutic value of this and I would support that. Um, I was a bit disappointed in the uh, planting plan. Uh, it seems to be a good plan, but there were, I think, opportunities for it to be a great plan. Reason for not using uh, more native plants and taking a, a more uh, diligent <sighs> focus on um, uh, pollinators and other habitat was uh, disappointing. And um, the, the topic of uh, the pesticide neonicotinoids um, it's not too much of a left field question for um, those in horticulture. So I was a bit flummoxed why it was a surprise and it really can be very harmful. Um, so uh, I am persuaded to not support the motion. Okay. Any other discussion of the, uh, of the motion? Um, yeah. I I was just going to say that um, I'm in the medical health field, and so I think the you know the level of disturbance I'm I'm definitely uh, concerned about that, that and appreciate Ken's comments and the conditions that he would impose um, for this application and agree with that. I, I would also supplement that I have some concerns about the impact on the residents, you know, many of whom are there for acute care. Um, so they're really at risk situations and again, there's a spectrum that covers anywhere between psychosis and depression, anxiety by you know, the gamut that um, Silver Health serves and serves incredibly well because they are such a top notch group of professionals that I'm sure take took into account as much as, po as possible what mitigating steps they could take, if any, um, in terms of the impact on the residents. Um, I'm more comfortable uh, knowing that facility and the type of professionals that they have in-house accounting for that, which I think is going to also be a benefit to, it's a benefit to the, to the residents, it's going to be a benefit to the, to the neighbors as well. Um, but I do have that concern. I appreciate Ms. Benton's comments that that was taken into account. I would have wished that would have flushed, that was flushed out a little bit more but I haven't heard any reason not to support the motion on that account. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I'll call the question. Um, John Goodwin, I vote yes. Mr. Chris? You're muted. John, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, no. Okay, uh, Mr. Radman? Yes. Ms. Discorn, uh, no, sorry. Uh, Mr. Turner? Yes. Mr. Ward? Yes. Mr. Casavan. Yes. Mr. Herring. Yes. Mr. Bash. Yes. Ms. Nielsen. Yes. Okay, motion carries.
Um, item number four, 941 Poneth Ridge Road subdivision. Do I have a motion for approval or denial? Need somebody to jump into the cold water. Uh, John Chris, I move we approve. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second it. Okay, discussion of the motion. Uh, let's say that the uh, uh, new lot would be created is um, uh, larger than the minimum size within the zoning area. There don't appear to be any wetland or other issues uh, occurring here that could be um, uh, problematic or potential concern to the commission. I've heard nothing from abutting neighbors uh, uh, adversely. Um, and uh, the applicant appears to have uh, gone through uh, all the appropriate administrative channels for a, a legal subdivision. Okay. Um, did I get a second? It was me, Krista. Oh, Krista sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, Krista. <laughs> Further discussion of the motion? Um, what I'll add is whether it's a subdivision or a resubdivision, as, as everyone knows, um, subdivisions are fairly straightforward exercises as long as they are appropriately ticking all the boxes from a technical perspective. The other thing I'll note is, is we do have the ability to delineate requirements of open space, but I, I think given the sizes of these lots, the nature of the subdivision, um, lack of access to any other open space, that um, open space is really not um, a, an issue because it wouldn't have a net contribution to the town on, on this particular application. Anybody else? Okay, I'll call the question. John Goodwin, I vote yes. Uh, Mr. Chris? Yes. Mr. Radman? Yes. Mr. Turner? Yes. Mr. Ward? Yes. Mr. Cassavant? Yes. Mr. Herring? Yes. Mr. Bash? Yes. Ms. Nielsen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, item number five, 1031 Owen Oak Ridge. Do I have a motion for approval or denial? Uh, this is Dan Radman. I motion to approve. Reasons for approval, Mr. Radman. Um, I think it's a well thought out plan, uh, less, um, less radical of a cut and fill than the previously approved uh, application for the site. Uh, I think the coverage uh, is not excessive for the size of property that it's on. Uh, the disbursement of the buildings uh, uh, creates a less dense condition of the various structures on the site. Uh, and they're able to reuse the existing office structure, barn structure in situ, um, which was uh, one of the requirements of the original application approval um, from a couple of years ago as well. Um, I think it's a handsome design. Um, I think it, it works really well on the site. Okay, great, thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Okay, I, I saw Kent first, so I'll take a second from Kent. Um, any further discussion of the motion? Okay, what, one thing I will say is I agree with Mr. Radman. Um, for, those of the, for those of you who were on the commission a few years ago, we spent a lot of time on this application. And I agree with Mr. Radman that this strikes me as a net less in complexity than the original application. So I think that's a good thing. Anybody else? Okay, I call the question. John Goodwin, I vote yes. Mr. Chris? Yes. Mr. Radman? Yes. Mr. Turner? Yes. Mr. Ward? Yes. Mr. Cassavant? Yes. Mr. Herring? Yes. Mr. Bash? Yes. Ms. Nielsen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, 1171 Valley Road. Do I have a motion for approval or denial? I'll move it. I thought that was an excellent idea to convert a poorly disused non-conforming structure into a rather architecturally sound uh, property. And I think that the use as proposed is consistent with our POCD. Right, thank you. Do I have a second? I second, second. that. Oh. <laughs> 
I'll go with Mr. Radman. He was loudest. <laughs> <laughs> Usually am. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> um, further discussion of the motion. Just to pile on, it was just a, a very handsome structure and nice to see that they're tying in the septic with the main house and limited additional site coverage. Seems like a very efficient use of the space. I'd also like to recognize the, the use of an all electric building, um, you know, in, in keeping with the conservation aspects of our, our pursuits, you know, all electric is, is much less um, intensive than, you know, propane or oil. Okay, great. Okay, I call the question, John Goodwin, I vote yes. John Chris? Yes. Uh, Dan Radman? Yes. Ken Turner? Yes. Dick Ward? Yes. Arthur Cassavant? Yes. Chris Herring? Yes. James Bash? Yes. Krista Nielsen? Yes. Okay, super. Uh, let's go back. Well, we are in regular meeting. Uh, item 8, 824G. Please see plan for bump outs on Elm Street in the intersection of South Avenue and Elm Street. Uh, Mr. Mann, you're presenting? Yes, I am, sir. Please proceed. Well, thank you very much for having us. Uh, this is a uh, proposed plan for bump outs on Elm Street, specifically from South Avenue west to the mid block crosswalk at the Playhouse. Excuse me, this, uh, this project has its genesis back in 2018 when we resurfaced uh, Elm Street itself and had to bring with a restriping plan um, the area into compliance with state statutes regarding parking within 25 feet of a crosswalk. At that time, we hired Michael Galante and his firm to take a look and they gave us a proposed layout, which is the ex uh, existing layout that we have now. Uh, in the downtown area that was approved by the police commission and restriped in 2018. Since that time, we've run into problems with uh, people disregarding the hashed no parking areas, uh, large trucks, people pulling in for uh, short stops uh, into various businesses, things of that nature. And then through that time, we started looking at different ways to uh, protect the pedestrian in this uh, very important area. <clears throat> Uh, we partnered with uh, West Cog and the city town of Darien for a bike route study. And part of that also had pedestrian improvements. And the plan that they put forward at the time mirrored the plan that we have here. Um, we submitted a community connectivity grant with the state for that project. Unfortunately, while I felt we had a strong application, we, uh, it had an equity action um, item in it and uh, we didn't score well on that portion and therefore we didn't uh, receive a grant for it. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, subsequent to that, we took a further look in the area and then COVID hit. So at that time we uh, decided to, uh, in order to enhance the outdoor dining um, and enhance the, the uh, I guess the, the entire experience in the downtown area, we put in barricades almost exactly where the, this plan would be. Um, to enhance outdoor dining, to allow outdoor dining, I should say, and uh, allow pedestrian access. Um, so we've had a look already at uh, how it functions. We uh, then met with the police commission. Uh, the police commission approved the, the, the barricades uh, at least twice, once on their initial installation and then once on an extension of time. And then subsequent to that, we went to them and met on three separate occasions, uh, April 21, May 12, and May 19, specifically around this um, design. And they, uh, they approved it in May of 19, uh, May 19 for uh, moving forward. And we're here today to uh, ask for an 8-24 review. Uh, we feel that it's in keeping with the plan of conservation development, specifically three separate sections, section three, section four, section five, uh, under section three, preserve and enhance the community character. There is a specific bullet under preserve and enhance physical character. It states, states that the village center um, should be uh, vibrant and walkable. Uh, we feel that uh, adding these bump outs in these areas, one, will enhance pedestrian safety, uh, and two, um, increase the pedestrian experience in and around the downtown which is uh, actually section 4B, extend and enhance the pedestrian experience in the downtown specifically. We feel that uh, with this and given the new state um, mandate whereby you need a four foot um, clear walk zone through your entire area, through all the dining areas, 
this will actually help us uh, with that as well. It will also take care of, um, uh, it will prevent people from parking in the no parking areas since they'll be hardscaped. And that uh, brings up the last portion, which is section five, enhanced livability, uh, specifically speaks about enhancing the walking environment. And then where sidewalks are, are recommended in business areas, we should correlate the sidewalk materials for function within the area. And we are looking to uh, create these bump outs with um, granite curbing and brick material. So it will be uh, just basically the, the look that is in the downtown area now only a little bit wider. So on the Northern side, um, from South Avenue to the Playhouse, we'll be taking out that entire uh, parking lane, that uh, parallel parking lane. We'll have a loss of five parking spaces on that side. But given the fact that we'll be placing bump outs on the Southern side and thereby preventing um, cars from um, striking a pedestrian in the crosswalk, we actually gain back five. So it's a net loss of zero. Um, with this plan from the previous striping plan of uh, pre-COVID. So I don't know if you have any questions um, about the plan itself or aspects of it, but I'm happy to uh, answer anything you have. Commissioners, questions? Yeah, this is uh, Dan Rat Tiger. Um, did I just understand you correctly that with all of this captured sidewalk area or captured parking area for sidewalk and some partial restriping that there's a net loss of zero parking spots pre-COVID? That's correct. How? We lose, five, we, we lose five on the northern side, but, but then we'll gain five back on the southern side. Dylan, if you can help me out and put it back. Specifically, if you're looking at South Avenue, uh, the intersection of South Avenue and Elm Street to the right, uh, you would call that the southeastern section. That bump out, since it's preventing someone from striking a pedestrian in that crosswalk, we're able to gain spaces in that area. Uh, and then in the area between um, South Avenue and um, the crosswalk at the Playhouse, we're able to do the exact same. So we're able to gain spaces back in that area as well. You're, able to, provide... gain space. You're, able, to gain... You're able to gain spaces by reducing the width of each of the parking slots? No. We... We are reducing the width of the parking spaces by six inches in that area between South Avenue and um, uh, the Playhouse itself. But the right. larger gain, the larger gain, um, that only allows us to actually fit everything in. The larger gain is the fact that um, while you'll, you can almost see down below underneath uh, the hash mark in the AC in front of what is now currently Dunkin' Donuts, that is all currently hashed as no parking. Um, given the right, fact that we're right. able to protect the pedestrian and the walkway because of the bump out, we can then move closer to uh, to the crosswalk itself and gain regain spaces in that area. So all of those pull-in spots are going to be eight foot six, and then all of the spots to the east of South Avenue going back towards Main Street, are those all going to be restriped at eight foot six too? No, those are nine, and the other ones are nine and a half. So they're actually bigger. We could, we right. Like, so we we uh we reduce them only by six inches in the in this one area. Everything else is is standard to what we have currently. But reducing that, it down to six, that makes it a very snug spot. Um, given given not, the driving right. habits of people in town and the parking habits and the size of vehicles in town, isn't that going to get a little too snug? No, we we when we if you look through the picture and you you. It, and you see the analysis, you'll actually see that everyone shades to one side of the parking stall. This actually has uh, some additional area in that um, in that realm. What we had done at the time uh, during the restriping originally from the police commission, we had them striped at nines and the police commission asked us to go to nine and a half throughout. So they're all at nine and a half. We're reducing it back to nine. Gotcha. So on the north side where you're capturing new sidewalk now, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just concerned about what we're doing here. We're effectively picking winners and losers in terms of the restaurants that are on Elm Street. You're, you're creating outdoor dining for uh, La Panco de Dan and for the Elm, uh, Elm um, but the restaurants to the west and Rosie's to the east are left stranded with no additional dining, outdoor dining area. Doesn't right. that we're, seem we're, we're not looking at if we're looking at it from a, a pedestrian enhancement situation and a pedestrian safety aspect. 
not necessarily. Was there a, was there a pedestrian right. safety issue pre-COVID? <clears throat> there's a yes, there's a pedestrian safety issue in the fact that everyone is not adhering to uh, the no parking areas specifically throughout okay. that. Okay, that, that let me let me cross. Okay. Understood. Let me let me rephrase that. Sure. Prior prior to the issue that we had three years ago, where there was a complaint waged with the state about our striping areas, where we mm. then lost parking spots to restripe. Prior mm. to that, was there a pedestrian safety issue? It was a pedestrian safety issue in the fact that we had parking too close to the crosswalks, yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, not exactly what I meant, but. Okay. So, so why aren't we, why aren't we treating the zones on the north side of Elm Street the same way you are on the south side of Elm Street, meaning you're, you're curbing out areas that have been identified by the state as necessary safety zones with no parking. But in lieu of that, we're now creating additional outdoor dining only for a select number of, of uh, restaurants. At present, correct. The, uh, the feeling is that if, if it is successful and we wanna expand, we could certainly expand on the Northern side, uh, East and West. Um, the only caveat is at that point in time, we, we don't know where we would be able to recapture parking spaces. Well, that's, that's, yeah. kind, of, that's kind of my big picture comment here is I've, I've spent the last 13 years on PNZ or sorry, 12 years on PNZ. And one item that's always been an issue is parking in town. Um, parking on Elm Street, parking in the lot behind all of Elm Street, um, parking at the center street lot. It's always been an issue and we've always looked for additional parking. So we're already talking about an application that's gonna take away 76 spots from the center street lot of, of you know, patron and commuter parking and, and employee parking. Um, and now we're looking to take away, a di well, I know you say there's a net, but we're taking away five spots where we could do this scheme and actually gain five spots. Right. Could. So yeah. we could do Our something field. that would help the town in terms of parking and not hurt us on parking while only benefiting certain stores. We could do that, except we feel that this would be a, a much greater enhancement pedestrian wise and a feeling for in and around the playhouse in the center of the downtown. We feel that keeping it in one continuous unit. Um, Michael Galante felt the same as far as in, keeping that curb line instead of bumping in and out for that curb line for those five spaces it was better to have it one continuous line itself we've also gone through covid for the past year and a half whereby we've had barricades up and down the area to the tune of a loss of at least 11 to 13 separate spaces um without um without many complaints or complaints at all i should say i haven't received any complaints about lack of parking during this entire time frame, and with the with the barricades that we had out at present, we were losing up to thirteen spaces um, on both sides of the street. At that time, this is now yeah, to, gaining to those be, back and having a net be, loss of zero. But, but to be but to be fair, the the traffic in town was also a net reduction in retail traffic over the uh, course of COVID. So you don't have as much pressure on the downtown parking situation over the last eighteen months. So it's a little bit different. What I'm afraid of is setting a precedent here for this, you know, let's call it uh, 200 linear feet of Elm Street or whatever it is, um, creating a outdoor dining and additional sidewalk area that, you know, uh, six months from now or 12 months from now, the balance of the retail tenant tenants that are to the east and to the west are gonna be asking the town to do the same. And we're gonna end up losing additional parking spots. I think we're setting a bad precedent. I think the town as a whole was a little disappointed when we needed to modify all of the currently striped no parking zones and had a net loss of parking needlessly, in my opinion. Um, I think we're we're fostering a, a worse condition here. I, I, I tend to disagree. I think we're, we're making, we're, we're finalizing a plan that was, that began in 2018, 2019 with that restriping and now formalizing it and uh, enhancing the downtown at that time. And then also protecting, protecting the pedestrian whereby just mere stripes on the road, we're, we're noticing that we can't. 
Mr. Chris? Yes, um, Mr. Mann, um, I will uh, complain about the lack of parking on, on Elm Street, but I understand it and I understand why uh, outdoor dining was necessary uh, given conditions. So I decided to uh, suck it up and take one for the team and uh, uh, understand what you're trying to do there. The, the question I have for you has to do with the intersection of South and Elm, in particular, the West, Southwest corner. And let me walk you through what my thinking here is. That it's a public safety issue. So as I understand it, the edges of this brick, these brick bump outs will be elevated from the uh, asphalt roadway. Is that correct? That's correct. They'll be at, they'll be at grade with the, with the existing sidewalk. So I'm looking at that corner, which is the uh, uh, where the uh, uh, art gallery is on uh, the south west corner, and it bumps out. And as what does the other one now, going north on Elm, and you have to excuse me north on south, and you have to turn left on Elm because it's a one way. Um, the uh, bump out really doesn't interfere with the uh, with the um, travel lane because you're going to be more towards the center of the roadway uh, as, you, as you drive up. Um, however, many people tend to bump through the uh, uh, stop sign a little bit. So they do a bit of a Hollywood stop and move into the um, uh, walkway if there's if there are no pedestrians because you really can't see around the corner very well with parking. And so if I look at turn, uh, going west on Elm and turning left and then south on South Avenue. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's a parental choke point or crunch point there because some of the roadway will be taken up by the bump out and therefore there's gonna be a choke point there. And I'm just wondering if there's a, a traffic issue and safety issue we should be thinking about here. Thank you. You're welcome. We, uh, we ran turning templates um, for our fire truck and also for large tractor trailer um, specifically on Elm Street turning left onto South or on South Avenue turning left onto Elm um, and each was able to make it without an accommodation. Um, so the feeling is that uh, the, the bump outs will actually not cause a, a, a restriction or, or a traffic issue in those areas and it'll actually um, Given the, the bump out on the southwestern side, it will actually help delineate the turning movement um, for a car turning left from South Avenue onto uh, onto Elm Street uh, and and also from Elm Street onto South Avenue with that additional bump out on the southeastern side will help delineate the travel lane and keep everyone in their in their respective uh, areas. Are there any particular uh, snow plowing issues that uh, the town may have in dealing with these bump outs? Not, you know, take a chunk of the curb out when getting the snow and ice off the roads? The, uh, well, that's one of the reasons why we armor plate them with granite. One that it's, uh, okay. we, don't have, we don't necessarily have to be concerned with that. Uh, will it hinder our operations? Will it, will it cause us a little bit of uh, headache and heartache? Yes. I won't say it isn't right now. We have, you know, curb to curb. They can they can run a airport plow straight up. Uh, we did review with the highway department, and that was one of the reasons also why we wanted to keep a continuous curb line along the northern edge, so we didn't have to come in and out um, okay. with the plow itself. And then <clears throat> we are going to increase the drainage um, on at both uh, on the eastern edge of both bump outs uh, on the southern side, whereby you see the hash marks, um, so that those will be snow disposal areas for us um, in the short term. And then we'll be able to clean out the snow a little bit quicker and uh, more efficiently from those areas. It'll provide an area of melting. The, that's the reason for the additional drainage. But we have reviewed with the highway department and, and while they're not completely satisfied, obviously because it's a change and, and it will um, hinder some of the operations or slow down some of the operations. To, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trade off that we'll, that we'll have to make. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're welcome. Chris Herring, I had a couple of comments to make. So um, I happen to fall on the side of this being a, a, a very strong move for the downtown, seeing the, the vibrancy in downtown with the outdoor dining and the economic development that that's 
you know, garners. Um, I think this is a smart move that is a best practice. I think having people walk an extra hundred feet is probably better for their waistlines as well as, you know, the downtown experience. Having seen, you know, my daughter get ice cream or other things downtown, she's highlighted how few places there are to sit in that downtown. And I think having a, a curb bump out like this is the recommended addition to, you know, most downtowns. You look at a Rye in New York, where you have a raised curb crossing, it reduces traffic speed, it creates a, a more friendly downtown and will drive economic development consistent with the POCD. So kudos to you, uh, Tiger, for, for, you know, balancing the, the traffic and the um, parking requirements. Having come from the parking side of the affair, I recall many tickets where people parked directly across that hash section or delivered um, deliveries in creating unsafe conditions. So this will uh, certainly prevent that. So okay. no questions, just kudos on my front. Okay, Mr. Turner. Yes, um, you know, I think Dan brings up some very, very good points about losing parking. It's, um, you know, I'm kind of torn on this one. Um, when you when you look at that intersection, um, it's really the gateway into um, our downtown. And, um, you know, if we believe in and we follow the uh, downtown village design guidelines, um, the proposed improvement uh, with these uh, bump, out, bump out sidewalks is, is actually a very good thing, um, <clears throat> short of the uh, parking issue. But um, I think this really does reinforce that entry into downtown. I think uh, seeing people dining, uh, maybe there's sculpture out there, different activities going on. I, I think it's um, in keeping with the downtown village guidelines. And I think it's um, you know kind of a first step in, in thinking about you know how do we really create a pedestrian environment uh, <clears throat> on the, along that street. But um, you know kudos to everybody that uh, participated in the design. And um, again, I'm you know torn about the loss of parking, but um, I guess we can't have everything. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions before? for Mr. Mann before I uh, call the question or before I ask for an approval or denial, sorry. I, I have one more follow-up question if I can. Um, were there discussions had with the other restaurants on Elm Street about this new outdoor, this designated outdoor dining area? We're assuming that all the COVID dining areas will go away once this is built. So did the other four or five restaurants on Elm Street that will not be able to participate in this dining area, they weigh in? We participated in a, uh, a several Zoom calls with uh, the chamber and all the establishments on Elm Street, both retail and, uh, and restaurant and showed them this plan and showed them what was, uh, what was being proposed. Um, so they're all aware of it. There were very little negative comments at the time of those meetings. I, you know, again, we're, we're looking at it specifically as a pedestrian enhancement at the time, um, and not necessarily an adjunct outdoor dining. Yeah, but the, it's both. We can't ignore the issue that it's both. It's true. So you're, you're telling me, you're telling me that um, the three or four other restaurants that are not going to be in front of this, that are not going to have an outdoor dining ability once this is all in place and the COVID dining's gone, they had no opposition to this? There weren't any comments at the time, Dan. The, uh -huh. uh, I, we did walk the area um, Friday, as a matter of fact. Lynn and I walked the area, and I walked the area with the town engineer, specifically regarding the new state statutes. And while some of the... the uh, dining will be reduced there will still be um available areas for dining for other established establishments up and down elm street specifically on the north side uh, so so then if if there's the ability the, the sidewalk is a pretty consistent width all the way across elm street on the north side so if those establishments are able to have outdoor dining in a quote-unquote safe manner and still provide sidewalk transit or tra uh, traffic along the sidewalk this is now assuming the COVID dining is gone. Um, 
why why wouldn't we just do the same thing here and and create the islands that you're looking for that would help to restrict the illegal parking and unloading zones and give back a net increase of four or five parking spots. Again, we felt that it was just going to, it would enhance the pedestrian experience and then the safety of the pedestrian in the area. And then also help our maintenance activities at the time by having a yeah, but established the curb line. The maintenance, the maintenance argument really doesn't, doesn't fly because you're going to still have to go in and out with the plow on the south side, you know, to address that area. So you, it's correct. You, you can't say, oh, it's going to help me because I'm going to have a straight plow because you're still going to have to do the same thing on the south side. It's a little different, but there is a there is an increased maintenance activity on the south the southern side. Right. I don't know. Um, I, I can see your points on uh, at the intersections and at the crosswalks, but I am a, a, a big advocate of maintaining parking in our downtown area. Having having witnessed a lot of loss of parking for you know for fee in lieu of parking and for all the loopholes that we present to business owners, um, it hurts us. One of the uh, one of the aspects that we're also looking at is. Um, in at three separate sections um, along the southern side, we're, we're proposing to add 15, two 15 minute parking spaces. So the first two spaces on the, at the intersection of South and Elm on the Eastern side will be uh, 15 minute. The uh, two spaces directly to the East of the crosswalk at the Playhouse on the Southern side will be outside of the uh, accessible space will be 15 minutes and then one mid block uh, between the crosswalk at the Playhouse and Park Street, we'll be putting in two more 15-minute parking spaces to try to help um, increase over, you know, uh, basically turnover in those areas to help increase the parking as well. Those were approved by the police commission also. Gotcha. I've okay. got a couple, I have one or two other questions if I may. Uh, the uh, brick that you're putting in, this is actual brick similar to the sidewalks that currently Let's exist? See. Yes, it's the, the same material. Same material, uh, fair enough. And um, along the, the north side where there's a, that long stretch of um, enhanced sidewalk, um, is, is there gonna be a, a fencing or a railing or anything like this between diners and, uh, and the roadway? There isn't one proposed, no. It's a, it'll be a six inch curb, uh, six inch granite curb along that edge. Thank you. Some more we have elsewhere. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mann. Um, Commissioner, so in an 824 G referral, um, the motion on the table is, or the question on the table is this plan consistent with the plan of conservation and development? Do I have a motion for approval or denial of that? I move we approve, John Chris. Okay. Reasons for approval, John? I see this as uh, enhancing pedestrian safety. I see this as enhancing the uh, uh, vibrancy of our downtown area. Uh, I see this as particularly helpful with uh, our dining establishments, with uh, outdoor dining. Uh, I see this as providing a more uh, congenial um, uh, surface area for diners and walkers than what we currently are using. So I see this as a, uh, a plus and consistent with uh, welfare issues of our plan conservation development. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, Mr. Herring, um, further discussion of the motion? I would just like to say that the POCD does specifically say seek opportunities to expand parking in the downtown area for the record. Okay. Anybody else? A um, couple of thoughts at my end. Um, as, as Mr. Mann pointed out, the, the objective here was not necessarily outdoor dining, but I think if there's any consensus in this town that the one positive of COVID has been the increase in outdoor dining. And I think, um, you know, when you think about it, the attractiveness of the town, the welfare of the town, the enjoyment of the town. So I, I think 
And I would just en encourage the town and Mr. Mann to continue to seek opportunities and be creative with, you know, other restaurants that uh, may not, you know, enjoy the benefits of this. Um, second is completely agree, parking is important, but um, you know, I, I think having gone through COVID here, I, I think we are going to need to reimagine parking. I think for a while, for a long time, I think there's going to be plenty of excess parking. I think the issue will be, will be people willing to work from say, for example, the railroad lot. I'm not convinced the railroad lot's ever gonna be full. So I, I don't wanna get into a big parking discussion. I'll also point out that um, Mr. Galante was the advisor to the town on this. Mr. Galante is extremely um, experienced um, and has done a, a lot of work for the town, knows the town extremely well. Um, so those are my thoughts. Anybody else? Okay, I'll call the question once again. The question is, is this consistent with the plan of conservation and development? Um, John Goodwin, I vote yes. Uh, Mr. Chris? Yes. Mr. Radman? No. Mr. Turner? Yes, and I'd like to add that this is also in keeping with the downtown village design guidelines. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ward? Yes. Mr. Cassavant? Yes. Mr. Herring? Yes. Mr. Bash? Yes. Ms. Nielsen? Yes. Okay. Uh, motion carries. Um, Item number nine, 105 Elm Street. Upon application, Jim Kane, authorized agent for Don Hersam, owners for site plan approval section 42C2 to allow Dunkin' Donuts restaurant in the retail A zone at 105 Elm Street. Who, who's here to present, please? Sorry about that. Hello. There we go. We can hear you. Good. Um, I also have my architect on the call if needed. Um, it's Brian Plour is his name, if, you, if there's additional questions. But basically looking to move the Duncan from 88 to across the street, have a little more space, updated look. And uh, I guess just, just need a change of use from the, the previous clothing store to a Dunkin' Donuts. I can't hear anything now. We lost our chairman. Oh, gotcha. We went to get a, a Dunkin' Donuts. Mr. Kane, what was your architect's name again? Brian Plord. <laughs> he finished early, Joe. Yeah, just my luck. <laughs> okay, we had no questions for the applicant. I have a question. Okay. Um, could the applicant walk through some of the specifics of the renovation uh, you're, uh, you're contemplating, including, uh, I assume there's going to be a handicapped uh, restroom on site? Yeah, everything will be ADA. Um, I don't know if Brian is on the call or yet, but um, basically there's additional seating, up, up, updated look, um, just all, you know, all the new and latest coffee equipment with a tap system. It's just basically just a, a nicer upscale design. And we're, we're really looking to capture the more space too that where we are currently is pretty, pretty small. Kent Turner, um, question, is this on two floors? Uh, I saw no, a stair. Just one floor. It's just one floor, but there yeah. is a stairway. Where do you see that? The uh, drawing A 1.0. I see that. Oh, that well, that that is a stairway that's out the back door in the on on that that site. It, it's not accessible to the public. It's just kind of like it goes to a an upstairs and goes out to the municipal lot out back, and also wraps around the back door to Soleil, the restaurant next door. So it's just a secondary uh, egress. Yeah. Yep. Great. Thanks. So a uh, question for you on the ADA accessibility to Mr. Chris's point. 
uh, the front door has a step in it. Uh, your ADA accessibility you're achieving by the side door, which I'm assuming has a level discharge. We actually have in the plans and on the call, I could be more specific. I just texted him. Did you were able to find Brian Plour? He's, he's, he's on as a panelist right now. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, guys. Brian Plour from GR Engineering. So, yeah, the front door currently does have a step in it. We're going to remove the step and add the ramp. Um, the entrance, we will uh, swap out the door, the existing door there, with a um, commercially available door with the proper hardware. Um, and to achieve the full ADA compliance, you're gonna have a push button um, automatic door opener. You're, you're gonna add a ramp, you said? Yeah, it's a six inch rise. So we're gonna have a ramp from the threshold back down to the sidewalk for uh, the land. That's, that's not ADA compliant. You need a landing area in front of your door, a level landing area in addition to the ramp. We could possibly do that by pocketing the door further into the building. Well, to my to my first question, is the side door level with the with the alleyway paving? On the no, that right? no, that threshold's at least six or eight inches higher than the. So than both the doors. So both doors are elevated. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, I, I think you're going to have to take a long, hard look at that ramp condition to make that code compliant. Yeah, we'll work with the building official. We haven't seen their comments back yet either. Okay. Yeah, obviously we wouldn't be able to pass through a building without all the proper, you know, um, specs anyway. And this this was in, I couldn't go to building yet until I had this meeting. So that's our next step, and I'm sure they'll work with us on getting done. What's you know right up to code. We're not going to. Try to yeah. sign anything in. Yeah. Sure. Understood. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, it's Ken Turner. Um, to the applicant, um, do you see any change in uh, people's habits as far as pulling up, parking, running inside, getting their coffee, and leaving? Um, I, I would assume just because you're changing locations, the other side of the street, that that really perhaps would not change? Do we have any traffic issues that we should be talking about or thinking about? I think it's relatively the same. I mean, it's directly across the street, you know, we can't control what our customers, you know, do. Um, with that being said, you know, there's parking still, the said parking will still be the same. Um, and we're, you know, we're right there. So I don't, I don't see any change or difference in that. Okay. Thank you. Everybody good? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion for approval or denial? I'll move it. I think okay. that it's a good idea to get a better ADA compliant Dunkin' Donuts across the street. Okay. I have a second. Ken? Okay. Any other discussion on the motion? Okay. Nope. Call the question. Uh, John Goodwin, I vote yes. John Chris. Yes. Dan Radman. Yes. Ken Turner. Yes. Dick Ward. Yes. Arthur Casavant. Yes. Chris Herring. Yes. James Bash. Yes. Ben Nielsen. Yes. Okay. Passes. Um, Item number 10, 18 Forest Street, AKA 90 Main Street upon application, John Luther of Gates Restaurant authorization for TRIO on Main owners for a site plan approval of sections 43B, 43C3 to replace patio windows with a garage door to promote open air dining in the retail B zone at 18 Forest Street. Who's here to present please? Mr. Luther is, uh, um here is here or is not here yep he's right here okay hello everybody hello we can hear you okay um would you like me to start yes please uh, applying for a glass panel uh, paneled garage door between the 
back enclosed patio in the dining room. The idea is to replace the existing French style windows that open, but do not allow for an open aired environment between the patio and dining room. Um, this, you know, would allow us to better compete with the restaurants with, you know, more um, uh, or larger outdoor, outdoor dining options. Okay. This is John Chris. So the uh, replacement you're contemplating would be similar to a standard home garage door, except it's all glass with the rollers. Those go up into this towards just below the ceiling. Uh, it's more commercial, but yes, I mean, it's similar. So it's, it would be metal frame, black metal frame, and um, it would be clear glass. And so if it was down, you wouldn't notice a difference much, but if it's up, it would be open air. So you'd be able to walk between the two and it would just have a better, um, it would provide for a better ambience during warmer months in the dining room. Is this going to be something that you have to physically lift or is there going to be like a garage door opener to move it? Um, as it's designed now, it would have a chain that you pull um, that would lock. But, you know, that can be revised. So opening and closing is, closing is human powered? Yes. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I actually had one other question. Um, could you talk about uh, insulation issues of this installation versus what you have now as far as, you know, cold air infiltration and keeping the heat in or the cold in as the case may be? I've been told that um, it'll be more effective in terms of insulation in the winter. Um, and we have, you know, radiant heating right adjacent to that. So that would help as well. Okay, thank you. The windows that are there are pretty old and have been there a long time. So I don't think they're, they're, they're pretty much like a sieve in the winter. So you're saying that this will be a- uh, An improvement. Tighter insta installation as far as uh, heat leakage or AC. Yes. Thank you. Anybody else? Everybody good? Okay, do I have a motion for approval or denial? Motion to approve Kent Turner. Okay, Kent reasons for approval, please. I think it's a um, <clears throat> environmentally uh, great idea to uh, be able to uh, open this window, this, this wall and use natural ventilation uh, inside the restaurant. Um, and um, it's um, uh, contemporary design thinking and um, it will be a, um, I think, a commercially uh, successful thing and um, I recommend that we approve. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, John Chris, I saw. Okay, I call the motion, John Goodwin, I vote yes. John Chris? Yes. Dan Radman? Yes. Ken Turner? Yes. Dick Ward? Yes. Arthur Casavant? Yes. Chris Herring? Yes. James Bash? Yes. Kristen Nielsen? Yes. Okay, great. Motion carries. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, items 11, 12, 13. Um, the library, um, perhaps this uh, point will be um, moot, perhaps not when the night is over, but the record on this hearing was closed a few weeks ago. Um, we continue to receive communications, um, including directly to the commissioners. Um, I respectfully suggest that please. Um, the seatings, just to remind everyone, we now have Claire on the line. So seated for discussion and vote on these applications is myself, John Goodwin, Mr. Chris, Ms. Ms. Nielsen, Mr. Radman, Ms. Discornia, Mr. Turner, Mr. Ward. Mr. Casavant and Mr. Batch. Um, when we do come to a vote, um, we will consider the overlay zone. Um, if that's approved, we will consider the map change. And if that's approved, we'll consider the special permits. 
as everyone, well, my take on our last meeting was um, we largely agreed on the new Canaan Library application X of the resolution on the 1913 library. I do note that Ms. Nielsen had concerns on the usage of an overlay technique um, as part of this application and, and more generally on the usage of overlay zones uh, within town. Um, what we agreed to do was to have uh, Lynn and Pete develop um, two potential approvals to be refined. Um, version one was sent to you, I think on Friday, then Lynn cleaned things up a bit and sent version two today. Um, so I was thinking, um, you all tell me how you'd like to do it, but I was thinking perhaps it'd be helpful if we asked Lynn to take us through um, the current uh, versions of each of the three potential approvals with um, the overlay zone really having a, is really being the option A and the option B, so to speak. Um, does that make sense, everybody? Okay. All right, I might, have mis I might have misspoke on, well, Lynn, why don't you go ahead and take us through you know, three ver the, the three applications. Okay. Three approvals, um, sorry. Um, thank you. So um, there are three, you should have received three, re three um, resolutions. Um, there's the regulation amendment, the um, map change, which is the overlay to map the overlay zone and then the special permit. And um, at, uh, as uh, Mr. Gerwin said that at the, at the June 3rd meeting, you guys directed me to um, address um, two options, option A and option B. There was no recommendation for a straight out denial, which is why you only see resolutions for approval before you. Um, so in order to try and keep things concise, um, I tried to include both option A and option B in specifically the regulation amendment and the special permit um, resolution. There was no discussion about the map change um, resolution. So there's only one version of it. Um, so if you were to, as you review it, there's both option A, um, which would, which, which I've noted at the top of, for instance, the regulation amendment, where you would um, include conditions number six and seven, but you would not include condition five. Um, and I've tried to embed them both in there, but I, this is your resolution. So at the end of the day, if you think there are additional conditions that would um, add to what was intended for either option A or option B, or feel that some of the conditions are not um, as you intended, um, it's your opportunity to um, make corrections and uh, we can address those. Well, Lynn, Lynn, do you want to go through each of the approvals? By the way, is, is Pete on the line? Yes, Pete, I'm here. He is okay. here. Okay, good. Um, so specifically... I mean, uh, do you, do you want to start by bringing up the overlay zone? Um, the, oh, the, uh, the actual... You want me to bring them up online? Yes. Oh. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think that would help. Let me see if I... So, okay, if you start the conversations, I, um, I, will, uh, I can bring it up in a second, but we, if we can start the conversation, I can bring it up in detail because I just have to do a little bit of technology. So give me one second. Okay. Anybody's at their computers at home, it, you, you did also get the email. Um, but I realize being on a Zoom and sometimes trying to bring things up is. Mr. Chairman, I'm just going to exit for 30 seconds. I'll be right back. OK.
Thank you. You're welcome. It's taking a little longer than I thought. One second, sorry, my computer is a little slow tonight.
right, so thank you for bearing with me. Sorry for the taking some time. So this is the uh, draft of the regulation amendment, which would be the first vote that you would have to take. Um, and some of it's, uh, um, the first part of the resolution is all the, um, whereas is the perfunctory um, statements. Um, then there's the findings. And then there are um, the, the uh, um, is the reasons for approval and then the approval. So for instance, um, in well, option- that's, Hey Lynn, why, why don't we just walk through? Yeah. So we can skip the whereas is. Um, findings number one is simply states where the properties are. Yes. Okay. Um, number two um, states that um, the overlay zone is consistent with the goals and objectives of the plan of conservation and development and are in conformance with the comprehensive plan for the town. Yes. Okay. Then the um, states that the adoption of the overlay zone will improve the welfare of the community, allowing for the development of the library. Then item number four, is the Planning and Zoning Commission recognizes that Section 5.10 of the overlay zone does not retain the 1913 or 1936 library. Then yeah. item number five is, Lynn, why don't you take us through that, how that works with option A and option B? So with, with option A, um, condition five would not be there. It would just remain with um, condition four um option five was looking at op, um sorry condition five was looking at option b which would um make an edit to the um o to the regulation amendment the overlay zone that was proposed by the applicant and that would um consider the preservation of um, significant historic structures on the site um and you and the commission as a whole at their special meeting on June 3rd had a discussion about what historic was. Um, there's, uh, there are actually two, uh, there's a definition of historic structures in section 2.2, which is the definitions in the New Canaan Zoning Regulations. But there's also a whole section um, in section 7.7 .7 that's um, dedicated to the preservation of historic structures. Um, so there's opportunities there for we're looking at historic structures that way. And um, this considers that, it, that some aspect of the historic structures on site, which the commission would say are historic, um, would be preserved and that a separate application would then need to be submitted to the commission with a final plan for preservation of any of the historic structures on site. And then the, the last two conditions, six and seven, are um, the, the, the additional design changes with respect to um, plant material and uh, the, the, per, the provision that the, any parking spaces on, um, require the, um, that an electric charger be provided. So Lynn, just going back to number five. So what, what this is saying is, tell me if I'm wrong. And um, Dan, you were a driver in discussions with Lynn, so you jump in. But what yep. this is saying is that the library, as for historical structure, is defined in 2.2. We ended up falling back upon a definition already in the regulations that the library will have to, in this case, submit a separate application for approval by the application. Lynn, is that right? Yes. Okay, Dan, is that right? That's, no, it's not. It's, it's kind of contrary to my point from the last meeting, which was we need the library to present a plan on how they're going to preserve the existing structure before they put a shovel in the ground, before they get approval for the new building. I'm not against the new building. Well, what I'm just, and I, I think many of us have expressed this, is we're just looking to see how the existing historic structure can be incorporated into the design. One of my suggestions at the last meeting was 
you know, even if they shifted and relocated the existing structure, not just a facade, closer to their proposed footprint, they could find an easier way to integrate it and still maintain a, um, a, a lawn or a great lawn or whatever they were looking for. Um, this, this language doesn't do that. Um, this, this leaves it wide open for the library to go ahead and build the building as drawn and come back to us a year later and say, well, we couldn't figure it out. So we're gonna give you some paving stones. The applicant shall preserve important aspects, facades or portions of all structures on site. That's, that wasn't the goal. The goal was to maintain the historic structure. And a separate application shall be submitted to the commission with final approval, but shall not uh, preclude a, other proposed construction on site. Again, that, that gives the library exactly what they're looking for, which is a way to build what they're doing right now, demolish the old building uh, you know, two years from now, and just say that we couldn't figure it out, so here's what you got. So do you have language then? Because, because I thought you and Lynn had discussed this. and I thought We did. We up. did. And that, that was my reply back to Lynn. I copied you on the email. I did not feel that this language represented the conversation we had. The, the goal of my point was to provide language that would maintain the, the, the historic structure as a whole and be able to either keep it in situ and tie it into the new building or relocate it on site and tie it into the new building, making it an architectural feature of the new building. Not as, as written here and not as proposed by the library, which made the press, I'm sure all of you saw it about a week, a week and a half ago, where they proposed taking a portion of the facade and sticking it on the back of the gas station and calling it a day. That, I'm sorry, but that's not the goal of the POCD. So do you, do you have language then? So, so as a suggestion for language, I don't understand why it can't be consistent with what we, what the language is in, in finding five, wherein we say the applicant shall preserve important aspects, facades, portions of all structures on site that are older than 1937. Uh, it seems like we kind of, we compromise that overriding point, which is consistent with what option B is, you know, that Dan is, that Dan is proposing when you when we start talking about maintained in whole or in part, when you say in part or just an interpretation of section 2.2, you're leaving the possibility, as Dan mentioned, of just slicing off a part of the facade, facade and abutting it next to a gas station and saying that's conservation. When what we should be doing throughout this document is really clearly delineating for people to vote on a very distinct option A and option B scenario. And I think that gets muddled in this language. It gets less muddled if we are just consistent in the language of the applicant shall preserve important aspects, that whole line, as opposed to something that could be contrary to that, which is an interpretation of section 2.2 or in whole or in part, in part being emphasized. So contrary, this is Krista Nielsen, um, contrary to what I normally say about how I think the process should work, which is that I think the zoning should come before the application. I think in this specific instance for the conversation tonight, the devil is in the details and the details are in the third resolution, which is the special permit resolution. And I think if we are able to come to consensus there, then it's easier to kind of pull up, if we even wanna pull up, to some more generalized language to include in the zoning regulation. Um, or frankly, we could just put the same specific language in the zoning regulation because as I've previously pointed out, it's only ever gonna apply to this project anyway. Okay. So do you wanna go to the special permit then? That's my recommendation, but I mean, I'm open to other thoughts on how we do this. I, I think that makes sense. Mr. Chairman, First, let's, let's start there. I don't know, when I look at this, um, as far as using an overlay zone for this particular uh, type of structure seems appropriate. In fact, the state law just got changed on this. So overlay zones exist. Um, and uh, I think particularly with very unusual buildings and uh, in a nice way, a library is an unusual building uh, would seem to be appropriate use of an overlay zone which would include consolidation of the various sublots that are in their footprint, which seem very reasonable to me. 
also. Um, I happen to like uh, option A. Um, you know, when I look at some of the points made, um, welfare of the community talks about supporting downtown merchants. Frankly, I think there's a lot more welfare uh, benefits to the community, um, you know, uh, assisting children with their education. We had a, a information or a submission from a video submission from the uh, students in our high school, uh, how important this is to them. I can't remember the first time or really the last time we had uh, high school students uh, make a petition to the, uh, or submission to the uh, uh, Planning and Zoning Commission. So I was very, very moved by that. I see this as a very important socialization um, uh, venue for the entire town, for every demographic in the town, as well as for continuing education for the adult community. Um, so I, I think there's a lot more welfare positivity out of this. Um, if we look at the uh, 1913 and 19, 1936 building, I know it was always pitched as the 1913 library, but it's not really that it. It's more of a marketing statement, um, uh, but it's the 1913, 1936, so they always talked about them together. You know, 40% of the building is already gone and has been um, taken away when the uh, current library um, was, was constructed. So what we have now is, is remnants of those original buildings. Um, and while I understand the interest in, in maintaining uh, the historical na the, uh, nature of these buildings, which you know played a very important role in our community, um, I, I think the uh, statement in um, uh, point five of the um, uh, option A uh, addresses that uh, adequately. And I, I don't see trying to re-engulf these remnant walls uh, as, as really a, a practical um, uh, practical solution. And so I, I think option five is, uh, is, is appropriate. The Planning and Zoning Commission, this commission will have full discretion to uh, say yay or nay on any um, uh, decisions or recommendations or applications on the part of the library regarding what to do with the um, older structures on their property. So we have full discretion. So uh, this really strikes me as the the appropriate way to go for uh, for this application. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, okay, well, but let's let's look at the special permit then. Um, then yeah, do you have that up there? Um, that is the special permit that's up. Okay. So as Lynn says, in option A, there's no condition 11. In option B, there is a condition 11. Okay. Uh, so I think you really want to look at uh, condition uh, 8 and condition 11. Those two conditions are really A and B. Right. But before we get down to the conditions on the special permit application, I think we also have to be careful about citing specific things in here. Again, I, I refer to the POCD and item number K, as in, as in uh, craft, I, well, I, I don't know, K, <laughs> um, under the findings where we specifically say here, the proposed New Canyon Library facility is consistent and supports the following applicable goals of the POCD plan of transformation and development achieve sustainability and resiliency. It does not achieve sustainability in that it is not maintaining the historic structure in town, which is one of the main goals of the POCD is to maintain that balance of uh, development and historic preservation. So I, 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 I don't feel we need to, I, I don't feel comfortable having that language in there. Well, then that could be, you could take out that language for your option B. That's fine. Right, but I also think if we go with option B and there is some level of historic preservation specified in the resolution that maybe then we have achieved that, Dan. Would you disagree? I mean, currently I would agree we have not, but if we are able to put something in this resolution that requires some sort of preservation of the 1913, 1936 option, have we not achieved? Then, then we have, yes, right. absolutely. So I, I think agree. it depends how that plays out. Can you go there? Yeah. Totally I, I think under option A, again, the library would be required to make an application to this commission saying we wish to preserve uh, piece, what is now pieces of an older library. That's all that's left. 
And we uh, would have, we as a commission would have full discretion to decide on that. So I, I think the full powers to uh, achieve those goals will be, uh, are, are fully realized in option A. Can you go to uh, finding number 12 one, please? Okay, so when we when it says in there, and I, I recognize the language can be different for option A or option B, or the finding mm -hmm. finding could be dropped for option for option B. But I would even suggest to those that are contemplating voting for option A, does it make sense to include that type of language that the New Canaan Preser Preservation Alliance failed to present a compelling alternative? Or, I'm sorry, compelling narrative as to why the Planning and Zoning Commission should require the New Canaan Library to, I mean, we start talking about a compelling narrative. I think we have to acknowledge at this point how comprehensive the effort was on both sides, um, how much time it took for both sides to put into this. And you know, I, this is a subjective, but I think most of us would agree that there was a lot of compelling points on both sides. So I don't understand the point of diminishing the effort on one side um, by saying it was not a compelling narrative. I, 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 I would, I would, I would agree. I, with, I would agree. I would agree. I disagree. I would agree with James. I think it just invites more divisiveness, and um, I think a lot of us, you know, some of us would find it not to be true. And why would we want to introduce more divisiveness into a subject that's already extremely providing power? And in a compelling, last thing I'd say about the a compelling narrative, I mean, entirely subjective, and we shouldn't be making determinations, hopefully, on things that are, uh, that we deem a compelling narrative or not. We should be doing it on the basis of the regulations that we have purview over and our interpretation of the application in the context of those regulations in the POCD. Correct, which, which brings me to point the finding number 13, which I believe should be struck completely from this document for both options. The Planning and Zoning Commission should, we should not be worried what state of advanced development this project is at in terms of evaluating its appropriateness to our zoning regulations and to the POCD. I'm sorry that they spent 10 years developing something that does not work for some of the town or some of the commission members, um, maybe they should have done a little more due diligence on what was, you know, uh, more important in terms of keeping the historic preservation of the older building. I don't think anyone's disagreeing that everyone wants the new library, a new library. To John Chris's point, it's it's, it's an incredible uh, asset to the town that would that would increase the vibrancy and the and you know child development, all, all the aforementioned items. But to say that we are now gonna be concerned about what advanced state of design the applicant is at and that we, they've moved too far for us to reject them, that is a huge can of worms for every future application coming to us where we're gonna have people coming, developers coming to us and say, well, we just spent a you know, million dollars on design fees and three years uh, putting this together, but it doesn't comply with anything you guys have in your zoning regulations but we still want to do it. That's what we have. Can, I think you can take out 12 and 13 and you're not really going to damage the resolution. Correct, correct. I agree. Correct. Because the guts of it are in the condition when you get down to number eight and number 11. That's correct. Which is, which is why I would I would suggest we focus on eight and 11 and we can always back up and address the rest of the document. Agreed. So as we move that direction, I mean, I wrote down some notes of a couple word terms that are being used because I think we need to be consistent with whatever terminology we use. And it, it may vary from option A to option B if that's the path we end up going down. But one of the things I saw repeatedly was um, a conversation about preserve and commemorate. Mm -hmm. and to me, those mean two different things. And I don't know if that mean different things to other people, but um, I guess my, I, I was curious, you know, where do we all stand on whether we want preserve, 
commemorate or the combination of both of those, because I, I think that's an important distinguishment to be made. I think we should be using the term preserve or preservation. Commemorate, the, the, commemorating is not the goal of the POCD, right? We're, we're not talking about a, you know, a flip book that has the history of the old library on there. That's not what it's about. But it's Dan, about- Dan, But Dan, Dan I, the good news is the library is way beyond that. I, I think we can stop talking about stones and flip books because we have advanced beyond that. But according, no, we haven't, because according to the published article in the paper that many of you have seen about a week ago, their current proposal is to take a fraction of the facade, of the facade and put it on the back of the gas station. So it, they're, still, they're still in that mindset that they're only looking to take a, a fraction of the building as a commemorative wall or a commemorative walkway or commemorative paving area. That's not preservation. Preser uh, preservation, according to the new preser the new Canaan Preservation Alliance, is the building in situ, and I think we've all agreed that in situ is not necessary. So maybe uh, ag agree. Let me finish. The first thing we have to agree is what do we call preservation. The second thing is look. My view is there's you know it, it's easy to say they're going to stick it on the back of a gas station. You know that sounds great, but I think they are willing to go much beyond that. I think, there, I think there's been movement through this process and, and probably in it perhaps, perhaps in their defense, perhaps there was not through their entire planning process, you know, sufficient communication to them of, you know, certain aspects of the town feeling that the 1913 library should be, you know, preserved, however we define that. Mr. Chairman, I would agree. Uh, I, I think the library is very amenable to an, an appropriate um, uh, preservation strategy, uh, which this commission would have full discretion to approve or not approve. Um, what we have now is, um, frankly, uh, the remnants of two older buildings that have been engulfed into a newer building. Uh, the original uh, New Canaan Preservation Alliance idea was what I refer to as the back to the future strategy, which is essentially reconstructing what was there in 1936, which means putting up quite a few walls as well as mechanicals and putting a new roof on. Um, and the, the Simpson plan talked about adding a portico and parking and having an easement on the library property and so forth, which is something beyond just preservation. Um, but um, I, I really didn't see that as, as, as workable, and I, I don't see the um, re-engulfment of the uh, older uh, portions of the current library as very practical either. I, I think the preservation issues uh, will be uh, addressed adequately under option A, and again, this commission will have full discretion to say yay or nay on that. So. Um, I, I think those issues that have been, uh, those concerns have been addressed regarding uh, appropriate preservation, I think are, are A, recognized and, and B, being addressed properly. So then is everyone comfortable with the use of the term preservation instead of commemoration, meaning knowing that we mean, and I think we say it consistently that we mean not in situ, but some sort of preservation but I, th I think we have to allow for the possibility, Krista, that it could be in situ. We, we right, should, we agreed. Should be Isn't the video games, Krista, Krista's point, uh, I, well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna say what Krista's point is. Krista's you can, point you can is try, John, I'm not gonna be offended. <laughs> no, you know, so I'll completely screw it up. But no, the point is that, you know, unfortunately, I wish the New Canaan Preservation Alliance and, and our own consultant, by the way, had been willing to move from the in situ only or the highway position. And if it could end up in in situ, quite frankly, personally, as I you know think about this over and over and over again, I'm not convinced the in situ position is the best position. I also do worry it could end up being if it if if it was sort of determined the way the alliance wanted it it to be it, it could end up being disconnected from the new library and it also could be a white elephant so to speak um but i i have no issue 
keeping in situ as a possibility. Um, but I do think, you know, I, and that I thought we agreed this last month was that in situ was not required. Correct. Okay. I agree with that. I think I if you look, if you look I, I, at the last, if you look at the last sentence of condition number eight, that's really what it's, you know, it is the assumption that significant aspects of the 1913 and or 1936, I'm not quite sure about that, building will be preserved in some meaningful way on, on the site. It doesn't have to be in situ. On the site, so, uh, subject to the approval of the commission. Right, so I think all of, well, we can come, I think we should come back to the 1913 versus 1936 conversation, but I think the term preserved is important. I think meaningful way um, goes on to be potentially defined in number 11, and that on the site, though not necessarily in situ are all important pieces of what we're trying to say. That that, I, I agree with you, Dick, that that really gets but then, the heart of what we discussed. But then we have to we have to look at number eleven then because number eleven the last sentence of number eleven basically gives the library an out. Alternatively, okay. if there is no feasible way to incorporate such historic structures into the library, then the library will not be obligated to revise its site plan to incorporate the historic structures. But if we, we do a, you're going to take out condition eleven entirely. You don't need it. I mean that's that's option B. Basically. Right, so I actually thought condition That's right. 11 weekend. But I'm saying uh, that should not, if, if, if condition 11 is part of option B, then that last sentence should not be in there. Correct. Okay. That, yeah. Okay. If, if, so, Dan, you are the author, so to speak, of option B. So, what you're saying is you would take out the sentence beginning with alternatively. Yes. Okay. I think, I think Dick brings up a really good point at the, the last sentence of. Uh, uh, condition eight, which states clearly that the it is the assumption that significant aspects of the 13 and 36 building will be preserved in some meaningful way on the site. Now, how that'll be for the library to present to us, we'll have approval on that. Um, and that brings me back to my, where is it? Um, the other point, which was in the was a special permit or was it the other one where it said that the library could proceed with its structure uh, currently submitted application and building prior to submitting anything for the preservation of the old library. I don't, the, the two conflict. We need, we need to see what they're going to do before we let them put a shovel in the ground. Um, I'm against that. And I, I know you are, um, but it's, but, but let me, let me finish, please. I'm against that because you know, the plan of conservation and development, you can view it as a positive consent or a negative consent. So, and Dan, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but sake of discussion, you know, you're, you're saying it's a negative consent document, meaning that if it does not preserve a historical structure, then it's not consistent with the plan of conservation development. You can view the plan of conservation development as a positive consent document which is, and, and I'm sure like you have been, I've been through the plan of conservation and development and thinking about the library approval. And I am finding a lot of sections within the POCD that are looking forward and arguing for you know, the future of the town. And so to put a hold on the construction of the library, it, in my view, is also a violation of the POCD. You see what I'm saying? You don't have to agree, but you know that's the view. Is I I don't feel we can hold up the construction of the New Canaan Library. I think that potentially potentially could be disastrous for the town. I so agree. I, well, I, I agree with I that. Agree. I. It'd be a darn shame not to have this new library built as soon as possible. I think the entire, I can't think of anyone in this town who thinks really that's a bad idea. You know, or I, really I agree with this you. Like, I, if I may continue, sir, if I may, I, 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 I think it is a uh, priority under our plan of conservation development to continue to invest in our town 
And I think this is a key investment in our town for now and I think for many decades to come. And I think delaying it further would be profoundly harmful. Mr. Chris, I think what you're missing in my point is that no one disagrees with you. Not myself, nor anyone on the New Canaan Preservation Alliance, nor any one of the 50% uh, of the town that are in support of his, uh, maintaining this historic structure. They all, everyone in town wants a new library for all the reasons you've mentioned. The difference is that the library has chosen a route intentionally to develop a plan and a strategy for a new building that completely eliminates the historic structure. That's what's at, at hand here. So they made that decision for a host of different reasons, whether it be financial in terms of cost impact for the same reasons they got rid of the parking underground, uh, you know, logistics in terms of staying in the existing building, which is one of our, you know, findings or conditions in the approval that they can stay in the existing building while they build a new one. There's a whole host of reasons they've done it. That doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean it's conforming to the POCD. I'm saying that, I, uh, you know, I think we're all frustrated that we've gotten to this point that the library has developed a plan that's gone this far, this deep, this involved, and this costly without keeping the historic structure. No. It could have easily been done. I brought that up at the meetings. Their architect of record, Centerbrook, they, they've done buildings exactly like what we are talking about here, where the historic structure has been maintained. And if I could add to that point, do we think that if we were to go back in time and granted, obviously we can't, and the library were to say something like this, this is the original, how they originally envisioned the design plan and they brought it to their donors in this fashion. You know, we're gonna have this wonderful new structure. It's gonna be the pride of the town, but we also in keeping with the POCD or the village district guidelines and the opinion of a lot of people that we surveyed, even though, even though there's gonna be some that are for the preservation of the structure and some that are not, we decided to default to preserving the structure because it's kind of indelibly linked to the character of this town. And so we're gonna preserve that structure. We'll have less of a green. We'll still be able to have events on the green, maybe not as many as we would before, as big as we would plan before, but we think it's the right thing to do and we can have kind of the best of both worlds. Does anyone here think that most of the donors and the people involved in the library contemplated under that plan would have said, no, that's ridiculous. We want a bigger town green. Raise, raise the 1913 building. We are dealt, we are passively dealing with a bad hand that's been dealt to us. Right. We have a really lousy hand, but we don't have any agency to kind of go back on it because if we delay anymore, we're going to compromise this town indefinitely. And you know, that that's that's a real stretch. Because the reality of this is if we choose, if people choose option A, in all likelihood, this is gonna go through litigation that's gonna last at least a year. Could be much more exhaustive than that. The idea that this is gonna be shovel ready if, we, if people choose option A, I don't think it's realistic at all. And then the other option we're given is if we go through, the, if we go through an e, in C2 or non in C2, but somewhere in the library camp, campus preservation 1913 library, then the library is then gonna go back and give back donations. I mean, this is it, really so. It, maybe, maybe that happens, but is that really in the best interest of the end of the town? That's choice that the, that the library will have at that point as well. So it's a, it's a really, if I may say, the library has put us, the Planning and Zoning Commission, in a really, uh, really unfortunate position. I mean, they've had this plan. We, the Planning and Zoning Commission, have been has have, have visibility to this design for the better part of one or two years, right? Pre-COVID. They could have come to us for approvals a year and a half ago when there would not have been a condition of, uh, you know, losing donor donations and being up against the timeline of, of construction and trying to get a shovel in the ground as quickly as possible. Now, it's, it's unfortunate, but here we are. And I think we just have to be careful as a commission to and again, we, we all said that we're not gonna have a, 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 um, a condition of denial. We want two conditions of approval, but two distinct conditions of approval. 
and the option B, call it whatever you want, uh, just needs to be clear on the, the level of preservation that we're looking for while leaving the library the flexibility to be uh, creative and artistic and, and do something that can work with their building and not giving them an out where they can say, you know, after their building was constructed that they have no use or they don't see a way to preserve the old building. So we're going to demolish it. It defeats the purpose. Uh, I think um, item A is not saying you can wait until after the building is constructed. Let me find the line. Hang on. And, and James, one comment I make as, as far as litigation goes is we we can't be driven by threats of litigation. I agree. No, I, I, I agree with you, John. We can't. Um, but I think there's there's the premise certainly on a part. A lot of people that have wrote, written letters to us might be watching in on this call. The sense that if we go with option A, it's imminent and it's really P and Z. It's this commission, these people that would choose not to have a library for our town by saying there needs to be more preservation than a slice of the facade. And the, the reality is it's probably something that's different. And so I'm not saying that we should be governed by the threat of litigation one or the other. I don't think we should, I agree with you entirely. I think what people, what not enough people understand is the likely reality of how this unfolds, no matter what we decide. Ultimately, when I consider uh, applications such as this or any application, uh, in, in keeping with our plan of conservation development and state laws, what's in the best long-term interest of the town of Canaan? And um, I, I think option A, which will reasonably rapidly build uh, the new library, which the town is, is crying for, a wonderful new building that I think could be a true landmark, and will also appropriately provide for preservation of uh, aspects of the older library or what's left of it, uh, which gives this commission full discretion. So if we want full discretion, we got full discretion. So it, it seems pretty straightforward to me. Well, how and about, you, don't, how about you don't think option B, you don't think option B would, would uh, satisfy that goal? I, I, no, I don't. I, I think option A is straightforward enough. I think option B is essentially re-engulf the remnants of the 1913 and 1936 library. And, and, and so uh, John, John Goodwin, I, I think just to just one last point on this, I don't think that this commission should make decisions on the basis of threats of litigation. I don't think that this commission should make decisions on the threats of um, donations being given back. Yep. I think we know what we think is right. I think we should, you know, again, I'm, I'm fairly new on this commission, but you know, I've been here long enough and been around town issues long enough to say that we're in a different position on this commission than someone looking in. And we have to make decisions on the basis of our interpretation of the POCD, the village district guidelines and anything else that's relevant that's under our purview. My own interpretation of that is um, a level of preservation that is aligned with what Dan is talking about. And I can't really think of many structures in town that um, there, that's it, where it's more necessary to follow the stated main goal of the POCD, which is a balance of conservation and development, than this project, where we can have potentially the best of both worlds. It might be more difficult to, at this point, I recognize that, but there was an opportunity all, all along the way, and I don't want to preclude the possibility of that in the future at all, because there's a long-standing partnership between the library and the town that's worked well for both of us. And I don't like the idea of ultimatism and threats on either side. In an effort to move this conversation about the resolutions along, I, I was, because I'm a little confused myself on the process outlined in eight and nine, um, in terms of you know whether we go with option A or B, so I, was, I have some questions and maybe Lynn wants to respond to what she was intending here, but if I read number eight correctly, it sounds like we're asking the library to present a consolidated report of options that they study to preserve or commemorate. I would prefer to see it just say preserve 
um, the historic buildings on site. And then in option or in finding nine, we tell them that they need to create a final concept plan um, that preserves or commemorates part of those historic buildings. I mean, I, I to me, those are options that, those are findings that build on each other. The report of options would kind of be the whole menu. And then number nine is kind of narrowing down the menu to here's the one we've decided is best. And I don't know if you meant that to be sequential like that, Lynn, or if they were kind of the same thing in your mind. Um, could you tell me what process you were thinking that this would follow, um, just so I know. Well, uh, Chris, Krista, I can I can jump well, in. Maybe there. you can. Okay. Yeah, I can jump in there as well. So, originally, um, number eight was an idea I had, and I talked to it about in the previous meeting, and I received feedback from all of you that there needed to be more teeth in it. Okay. So I think what I said to Lynn and also said to Pete is think about what can put more teeth into the concept that was in number eight. So in a way you're right, they do build upon each other. Um, but but that's part of the thinking there is, is so think about eight is something we want to achieve and I, by the way, I have no problem based upon our agreement on the definition of preservation as a commission. I have no problem taking out commemoration. Um, and, and so then number nine is, okay, here's how we're going to get this done. And you know, look where, where, I, where I'm going to be repetitive. But um, you know, James, it's not about the library losing donations. It's about this project going forward. So what I'm trying to find here is for the project to proceed. And you've got, we're putting a time frame of one year. You really have two years, but they're gonna have to come up with something within one year to you know, provide something that preserves the 1913 library and something that's satisfactory to the commission. I think, Dan, I think, Dan, one of the, uh, you, the, I'll make one more point to you is I think, unfortunately, one of the points you made, which I think is a, was a great point, I completely agree with you, is that, you know, if, you know we're, we're, we're all talking about winding back, winding back the clock. And if we could have wound back the clock, we would have had the 1913 library somehow incorporated. And you talked about this um, right. somehow incorporated into the new library. And you know, in my mind, I, I if it could be done, that'd be fantastic. I, I think it may be too late, but you know, and then I also fall back upon, you know, what you've said about Mr. Herder and their architectural firm is is you have you have stated that you know the library has a top flight architectural firm that has a track record of you know preservation, again in the commission's definition of preservation. Um so. I, I, I think that, you know, the game is not lost in terms of the preservation, even in option A. But, to, but I, I, I digress. Going back to your point, Krista, that that's the idea behind eight and nine. Sorry. Well, then I guess my next question is for Mr. Gelderman. If we ask through our conditions, the library to put together a report of options for preserving the historic parts of this property and come up with some sort of final concept plan built upon those options. Do we, as the commission, have any ability to opine on that after we close the special permit? Or is that still purely an administrative, sort of like they can come back to us and educate us on what they've decided, but there's no back and forth conversation? Well, I think it depends on how the condition is exactly phrased, but you can make that condition, it can require the library to come back to the commission um, with a specific plan um, for preservation, if that's what the commission wants to accomplish. The difficulty with that, as, as we talked about at the last meeting, is what happens if they don't come back with a plan that's satisfactory to the commission? Um, and so I, and I don't know the answer to that. I mean, if that condition- Pete, 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 can I give you an idea? Sure. What if there is some sort of working group of which 
let's say the planner is a member of that working group. Well, but that, are you assuming then, John, that, that an agreement can be reached? That a plan can be adopted that is acceptable to either the working group or the commission? Because there's no guarantee that it will. I'm just looking down the road, what happens to the special permit if um, that condition is not satisfied? Yeah, I guess what I was getting at was, can there be, um, you know, with Lynn as the vessel of the commission or some other way where the commission has some ongoing participation in the development process as opposed to us waiting a year to get a plan? Because I, I think that's some of the, you know, can I, what, go ahead. Can I offer a comment? Sure. To, to that point, John, why does it have to be a year, right? We, we are looking at um, condition eight and nine, or specifically eight. Um, why does it have to be a year for the library and their team to develop a, a, a schematic? I mean, we're not looking for a full set of construction documents that are buildable and permittable. We're looking for schematic design that's presentable to a planning and zoning commission for an overall design intent of how they plan to maintain and, and preserve the historic structure. To answer your question, I am not wedded to a year. Yeah, I mean, knowing what's involved, knowing the players in this case, Centerbrook and their capabilities and their bench and, and how, how good of a firm they are, I have no doubt they could put something together in 30 days. Even if we wanted to be conservative and say, give them 60 days, do it. Use option A, put a clock on it. Yeah, put an option A and put a clock on it. At least that'll give us, that'll give us as a commission and as a town, some level of comfort with whatever plan they propose, and I'm, and I'm being optimistic here that it's a, a workable, viable solution that's agreeable to everyone, that they could come back to us in a shorter period of time before the shovels hit the ground and it becomes less of an issue for everyone. I don't disagree. I, 30 days sounds aggressive, I'm hoping, you, you know, but I, they, I don't disagree with any of that, but I, I do feel that they have to have the ability to get going. I don't think it's unfair to not allow them the ability to get going. But if you want to put their feet to the fire and make it a tighter time frame, I don't have an issue with that. John, it's Ken Turner. Um, hey, Ken. There are methods of you know delivering the project as far as the construction <clears throat> that. Um, could allow them to do that. They could have multiple bid packages that uh, they, they could have a foundation package, site civil, the building core and shell. Um, these are things that um, could advance while the design is being revised. Um, it's done through what they call an addendum process. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it could result in little, if any, delay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is feasible. It's done all the time. Okay. Yep. And I'll be happy to sit with uh, Turner Construction or whoever with the library to, um, you know, help them, uh, you know, guide them through that process. Mm -hmm. Now, Ken, you're talking about a redesign that incorporates 1913? That is or, a possibility, yes. Or is the 1913 preservation sort of a separate, a separate structure? No, I think the premise is that um, we would, uh, that they would find a way to preserve and to incorporate into the new design, the 1913 design. But what I think you're saying, Kent, is that they there's also options for them to proceed. We don't have to stop all construction Correct. while they do that process. They can that, continue that to move ahead correct. and figure out the redesign at the same time, is what I was yeah, saying. Knowing, yeah, knowing Kent and I both know that how companies, larger construction managers like Turner work, this is not going to be a single big package of drawings that's going to hit the streets that's you know 300 pages thick. 
It's going to be broken into packages as the architects and engineers develop the, the construction documents. There will be a foundation and site permit set that'll come out first. If you guys remember uh, when Merritt View and, and Carp and his team came to us, there were three separate packages that there was site development, there was foundation, and there was major structure. All, all larger projects are broken up like that. And it, it would allow the library to move forward with the first phase, let's call it that, um, site development and foundation while they're still finessing and resolving and redesigning to whatever degree the, the aspect of the historical structure and how it's incorporated in, and in what, may, um, what ways it's incorporated into the new building. Yeah, but the, the issue that I have to raise here, guys, is if you had a situation where either party showed any indication that they were willing to proceed on that path, that would make a lot of sense. From the evidence that has been presented so far, um, th there's no indication that, that the library wants to go that way. Um, I, I think that going down that path is, is quite difficult. I, I happen to agree with John that we need to get this library moving along. But I think that to provide a, you know, sort of a, a, a less than complete guidance about what the expectation is will not do them a service, no, nor even the uh, folks from the preservation community. I only see uh, uh, compelling the library to take out a clean sheet of paper, redesign its building to re-engulf the remnants of the 1913 and 1936 libraries. I don't think that dog won't, well, that dog is not gonna hunt. It just isn't. Um, and so I think the issue so is either is, is if I if I may continue, sir, I, I just don't think that dog's in a hunt. I, I think the issue is really what sort of preservation of these um, remnant walls of these two older buildings are appropriate. And really, I think that's where eventually we have to stick a pin in a decision. Thank you. Well, that gets back to uh, number eight, which I think number eight contemplates that the preservation of some meaningful portion, whatever that is, of 1913 is a separate structure located someplace, maybe where it is now, but maybe some other place, but on the same premises. But they can get on with building the new library that's already been designed. But the, the issue I wrestle with is the 1913, 1936 library is not a structure. And that if you take away the non-1913 and 1936 portions, you end up with a partial shell of a number of walls. There's no structure left, unless you want to force them to re again go back to the future and completely rebuild what was once there in 1936 which is certainly probably doable in the grand scheme of things. But again, I don't think that, that that's a dog that's gonna, gonna hunt. And so if you, you wanna remain it, keep it there in C2, you'll just have essentially a number of walls uh, standing with uh, some windows. So John, where you're wrong is the, the structure is there. It has been peeled apart over the years in order to incorporate the additions that have been done to the building over the years. But the pri primary uh, structure of the beams and the supporting columns and piers, that exists. It's been clad over, it's been, it's been butchered, it's been opened up, it's been used. To, yeah, yes, it has. Yes, it has. It's I've been require, in the building, it's not there. I've been in the building too, John, and it, no. it will require rebuilding, absolutely. Only the, the east rebuilding. and the north facade are, are in their uh, original state to some degree. The, the west and the south facade have been butchered. But to say that it's impossible to, to keep the building as a footprint is not true. It is possible. It is, it's absolutely possible. Look at the, the report that was handed down from the POCD's, uh, um, sorry, the New Canaan Preservation Alliance's consultant. It's been done before, it can be done here. The, to your point though, let me finish, sir. Uh, to your point though, um, is it worth doing? I don't know that. That's not for us to solve. Our, our mandate is to maintain and uphold the, the, the code and the regulations that are in this town. And to your point, look to see how we can look to the future of the town and what's gonna be best for the town. Some of us believe that 
the preservation of the historic structure is a, 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 a vital artifact of the town that, that necessitates preservation. Others like yourself don't believe that and think that you know some smaller facet of the building could be memorialized somewhere else on site and let the building go through. So we disagree on those points. But you know, to, the, the, the shell of the building is still there and it can still be saved. It could be done in situ, but I think I, I for one, also agree, I don't think it's the right situation or, not, or the right solution to do it in situ. I think doing it in such a way, and I said this during the last meeting, I'll repeat it again, but to take that east facade, take that north facade and take the footprint of what was that building, maybe shift it on site, which everyone's agreed can be done on site, and somehow incorporated into the building would be the level-headed compromise that could have been done years ago, but it's what we're talking about now. It would provide the town with the full library uh, design that we're, that's already on the table, and it would provide the other half of the town with the historic preservation that everyone's looking for. So I have a question for Dan and Kent. If, if it was preserved in situ, wouldn't that um, cause much less of a delay in a redesign than if it, if it was relocated to another part of the library campus? Isn't it, would, it, it would, but yes, it would. Um, but I think the, the it, it comes down to staging and Ken, correct me if I'm wrong in my sort of understanding of what's going on here, but it, it has a lot to do with the library staging and operations in the existing building and when they transfer out into the new building and how much additional cost it'll do, it'll take to make that transition, then keep the existing institute building and renovate post move. So it's, it's sort of a compounding of, of costs. It all comes down to numbers and, and cost at this point because the preservation of the historic structure, whether it's in situ or whether it's shifted or how it's incorporated into the building, it's all dollars at this point. It's an increase in dollars, no matter what. Now, now to that point, um, we have testimony from the town, first selectman, yep. that they would, you know, if it was appropriate preservation, <laughs> what we're all struggling with, but, you know, the town would be willing to help with, you know, that bill, so to speak, to your, to your point, Dan, it's all about dollars. I, I guess where I come out is I would still like to give the library within certain guardrails the flexibility to make the decision of whether it's, you know, what I think you and Ken are advocating, you know, design it into the building versus in situ versus, you know, a potential third alternative. I, I'm a little hesitant to tell them that they have to redes re redesign the building. I'd, I'd like the idea better of saying preservation, like we're all talking about, but give them some flexibility. So, so just to pick up on that point, and it, it and it dovetails what with what you were asking before, Dick Board, about what is what would, how do we define meaningful in the context of of conservation or preservation? And I think it's it's really important that we have a clear delineation between option A and B, and what is um, conservation slash preservation within op within option a rather than using the word meaningful which to borrow you know a phrase from john chris earlier or uh, we spoke is is kind of a fig leaf in my mind really kind of clearly defined what meaningful is is meaningful that 20 by 10 slice of a facade you know abutting the western part of the campus is that what meaningful is I would hope that, not the option that, that I'm gonna choose, but for those that might choose that option, that it's really clearly delineated what meaningful means before you vote on it. Yeah, I agree with you, James. That was kind of some of my other questions. I mean, I think we need to discuss whether we're only talking 1913 or 1913 plus 1936. I think we need to talk about the, the language uses the word building, it uses the word facade, it uses the words facade plus roof. 
So, I mean, I, I think the definition of meaningful is important. And I think those are some of the terms that you will find in that definition when we reach that point. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, well, I'd go the other way. I think um, if you try to define all of these terms, we'll be here for the next six months. I, I don't know, but John, couldn't it be just option A? It's is the scenario that's been most currently contemplated by the library, which is again, 20 by 10 foot slice of a facade. But it, it, it could be that. It seems like that's where the library is willing to go. Um, that is movement on their part, I have to admit that. And so maybe it doesn't take months and you know hours of contemplating our navel, it's just that. That's what they've said. They. That's like, I interpret that, John, as like the last concession. We're willing to move to here, but you know, that's kind of where we're parked. Well, I thought, but, but James, I thought where we're going with this discussion, uh, you know, potentially I was, I started to hope maybe there wasn't an option A and or option B and we could all agree. Um, meaning that we don't predefine whether it's the facade or whether it's a redesign or whether it's in situ, you know, if, if we could, you know, again, I, I guess my line in the sand is they have to be able to go ahead with their project. Correct. Yes. But if we could take eight and nine and, you know, maybe give it even more teeth, you know, Dan said, shorten the time frame. let's shorten the time frame. Let's put, you know, their feet to the fire. I just get where we all know, look, we're all professionals. We, we've all negotiated deals. And, you know, to, to try to define every single term, I think is going to be tough. So the way I'm thinking about this is if we can, and this is part of my question of Pete and probably, and what I was trying to do with nine is if we can have, you know, participation in the process you know, and perhaps this could be more creative and, you know, hey, yeah. you know, maybe Mr. Herder is just itching to do something really cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think he is. Okay. I could put money on it. John, okay. John can you hear me? Can just, can just, John, John Goodwin, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I would just like to say, I, I, I really feel like everyone's really making the library kind of the bad guy, They're not trusting them to kind of do right by the process. I think they're, they may have been surprised about the level of support for the 1913 building, but guess who wants this project to go forward more than anyone? The library. So if we tell them, we want you to come back with something meaningful, preserving, commemorating, whatever we want to use the words, I guarantee within six months, I wouldn't do 30 days. I think that's a little ridiculous. Three to six months, I'm sure they are gonna come up with something that will be amenable to us. If we are engaged in the process, even better. But let's just give them a chance. Like we are so busy saying they're not gonna come back. They're just gonna do this. Let's give them a chance. Give them three to six months, see what they come back. We don't need to define everything for them. They know their their pro they know their task right now, and let's just let them come back to us. Well, we, we have to we have to. There's we're conflating a couple of things, and I think we just have to be clear on what we're defining. We we can define what we want preserved. We don't need to define how we want it preserved. We can't right? agree on this commission what we want preserved. <laughs> but Claire, can I make a point? Just I I hear you totally. My concern overall, Claire, is that in three to six months in that time period, and I agree with you that the library will come back with something that um, many will deem you know, meaningful and substantive, um, that we're in the same position three to six months down the road with and having this a similar sort of conversation as we are now. And I think we all want some resolution. I don't know that three to six months time and the library coming back to us is really going to afford us a clearer resolution than what we would have, you know, if we were to make a decision very soon. So what do you suggest, James? I suggest we really clearly delineate some of the terms so that we have resolution around what an option A and option B looks like, and we take a vote. Right. I, I would agree with um, Commissioner Tuscorny. I, I, I don't think 
getting too deep in the weeds is, is, is really appropriate. I would like to hear what the library has to say. I think her comments that the library has been seen as the sort of the bad guy in this, I would, I would agree with that. I, I, I think the library has um, uh, certainly a view on what they feel is appropriate for their property and which is, I get that, but I think they have heard some of the uh, views of the town too regarding preservation and um, you know, my view is 90 days is more than enough, but I would agree with the chairman too, that we need to get off the dime on this one. And I think there is a compelling need, need, in, need in our town for a new library. And um, time is money and tick tock. Um, you know, the longer we wait and the longer we argue about this, you know, the, 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 the less of a library we're gonna end up getting no matter what it is. And I don't think that's in the best interest of the town of New Canaan today or 20 years from now. I hear what everyone's saying and I, I can agree a bit with both sides. I mean, it does seem like we're going to the weeds to define what we think is meaningful. And yet I'm afraid that the 10 to 12 year process that has led us to this point hasn't been specific about what was meaningful. And that's why we're here now. And I'd hate to right. give them three to six months more and have them come back with something that's still not meeting the expectations of people. So, I mean, I, I don't want to necessarily regulate this, but I think we should be very clear to them, like which parts of what's historic in our eyes should be preserved in some way so that we don't, you know, just kick this can down the road as someone else has said, you know, three to six months and then have to say, oh, sorry, you still didn't nail this one. Agreed. Num agree. Number nine says that there will be an external advisor hired by the town. So presumably we have some say as to who will be the external advisor to work with the library to come up with some meaningful preservation. And I, I think that I, I agree with John and, and others that they have to get on with this, with the basic library, the new library. And to hold that up, we're, we're going to have a lot of, a lot of people unhappy. Okay. So I'm going to take off my partisan hat. I'm going to put on my chairman hat. <laughs> um, maybe what we could do, and, and again, I'm, now I'm just trying to listen. It seems like, I thought we could reach consensus, but I think we've diverged again. Um, so maybe we're back to option A and option B. And option A, the corpus of option A is probably eight, nine, and 10. And then I think option B is what some of you are saying is you wanna define what has to be preserved. That's now sounding like option B. I mean, is that right? <clears throat> James, Dan? I don't think we can define it. Well, I don't want to, but. <laughs> Why? No, I think we can. I think it's our responsibility to define what the historic structure is that we want preserved. I agree with you, John. Option B would, would say right. to some degree, and, and I'm just, whether it's the, you know, noting that it's the east and the north facade and, and roof line associated with those two are preserved to some degree on site. Um, you know, we all agree. Well, how do we, Dan, how do we get there then? Meaning, what I mean is, you know, we we reached out for, for special meeting dates and clearly we're not gonna take a vote tonight. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, Lynn needs, Lynn is nothing against Lynn. She's not the one now to define this. I think, you know, for, for those of you who feel that it should be delineated, you know, it's now up to you all to figure that out and tell Lynn what to put into option B. I mean, feel free to tell me if you disagree and if I'm misreading this, but. You're right. We got to yeah. do that. That should yep. be done. I mean. Okay. Incorporate the facade in some meaningful way. Yeah. And I think. I, oh, I, no, but, but, Dick, but Dick, Dan is saying you can't just say incorporate in some meaningful way. I think what you guys are saying is you're going to define, which scares the heck out of me. Yes. But, but, but if they incorporate the facade, okay, then the facade is going to have to appear in the meaningful way. 
And what else is it beside the facade? But which facade? East and north. Right. Why that? Because those are the remnants of the old buildings that are still intact to some degree of originality. I think to you your know, point, to your point, the south facade and the west facade have already been taken apart and modified to integrate the additions that were added over the years. They've been torn down. So, so what I, th I think, you know, to that point, we already have the basis of some of the language and it could be further fleshed out, clarified, but in finding five within the overlay zone draft, when it says, and I quote, the applicant shall preserve important aspects, facades, portions of all structures on site that are older than 1937, I think that's an accurate characterization of what scenario B is gonna look like. And again, it can be further fleshed out very soon. It should be very soon. Um, but conceptually, that's what it is. But I still think that scenario A is more than adequate for us to achieve the needs that have been discussed by this commission and by the community. I know, and, and look, we're, I, I know this is gonna be one of those things. It's divided the town, it's dividing the commissioners. I, I get all that, John, like John, Chris, I, I totally understand your points. I think what it might come down to is different interpretations or weightings to different no. aspects of the POCD and the village district guidelines, and along with the, the overriding notion, and I totally understand your part and, and others, that this is a project that's really important to the town. And um, yes, we've been dealt an, a really lousy hand, but it's from this moment forward that's relevant. Um, and I totally get that. I, I understand where you're coming from. Okay, well. Um, Goodwin, it, yeah. would it be option A would be what we have now. And option B would be like, we're gonna dive in and tell the library what exactly it is they need to come back to us. I'll, with I'll, I'll let Dan and I'm, I'm you know, now I put my partisan hat on. Eight, nine, and ten is the core of option A, and I guess and what we if, need. What, you team, do it. Let me just finish real quick, Dick. What we need, I, th I guess, James and Dan to do is to come up with option is to, to wordsmith option B. Sorry, Dick. No, I was just saying that you could have option A, eight, nine, 10. I agree with you there. And, and I think that you can put, put maybe a few teeth in that to, you know, I don't want to say it makes it closer to option B, but maybe it just makes it clearer that there is some meaningful preservation. And, I, and if I can just speak to option A, I, I, I sincerely believe that giving the applicant, if it's option A, giving them 90 days to produce a solution is not unreasonable at all. It yeah, should I not take with, a year. I would agree with that. I think 90 days is enough time. I would it should not that. take a year. 90 days is enough. It's like yeah, a lot of I things, mean, give them a week, they Dan, take let me, let me be clear about the year. I plucked that out of the thin air. I'm, I'm completely yeah, yeah, yeah. flexible. No, and, and just, to, just to complete the thought, it's for both option A and option B, quite frankly. There's nothing that says for option B, they can't produce something in 90 days that could satisfy our concerns. Okay, well, let me ask you, you and James and whoever else wants to jump in, can you guys come up with wording within the next week? Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm so confident in Dan. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Pass the buck. Pass the buck. He is he is a wordsmith. They won't be able to agree. I can see it coming. Wordsmith. Okay, for the and, and let me ask uh, Pete, Pete Well, So I think we have an agreement, which is um, eight, nine, and 10 will f form the core of option A. Um, to Dick's point, if um, for those of you who believe in option A, who can put more teeth into it, as well as Lynn and Pete, we can beef that up. Then James and Dan will work on option B. Um, and then it seems to me, Pete and Lynn, tell me what you think about this. I, I think it was good that we moved to the special permit. And I think if, if we can get these two options um, drafted in the special permit, 
then we can backfill into the overlay zone. We will have an overlay zone option A and an overlay zone option B. Lynn, I, I think where what we need to do different this time, Lynn, is we need to have an option. Tell me if you guys agree. We need to have an option A for the overlay zone and an option B for the overlay zone. And we need to have an option A for the special permit and, and, and an option B for the special permit, just to make it crystal clear. Because Dan is right. And Dan, I knew you were going to bring this up because I agree with you based upon your position is, you know, some of the stuff you read in, you know, some of the, the, the findings is, you know, counterintuitive to, you know, option B. So obviously it can't be in there. So right. we have to break out these documents so we have consistency of language for each of the respective votes. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Everybody else, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yep. So Dan, you can, Dan, James, you can work with Lynn over the next week. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. Because what I would like to do and, is and I would still like to explore getting a, oh, Kent's, Kent's yelling at me. What's up, Ken? Ken wants to be part of the party. Even, yeah. even though I wasn't invited to the party. I'd yes, like please. Crash it. Well, <laughs> you, you broke the volume on your computer, so. <laughs> God damn it, I've turned it up as loud as I can. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll be the layman of the group. Right, I thought Ken was going to talk. <laughs> then he muted himself. <laughs> he just volunteered. He just wanted to be part of the party. Is this a okay. sign of what's to come? Just muting yourself for the next. No, seriously, Ken, did you have something to add? No, I just would volunteer to help out. On oh, oh, oh! I'll be part. Okay, now I get it. Okay, <laughs> the light bulb just went on. Um, and then Pete and Lynn. I mean, do you do you all agree? that if we, we come up with option A and B, option B in the special permit, that then gives us the ability to backfill into the overlay zone. Do you agree? Absolutely, yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. When do we have to decide? When do we run out of time? Uh, we still have lots of time. Lynn, what's our deadline? Um, well, um, as Pete Gelderman said um, last meeting, it's 65 days the public hearing, which is on May 25th, and um, our July 27th meeting would be 63 days from the close of the public hearing. So we would have to have a special meeting sometime in July. Oh, so I was wrong. So we need to have a special meeting in July. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, Not a problem. You know, in a way, that's good anyway. Now, the, the only thing that I'm concerned about is that I think it's very, very important that um all um how many seated do we have eight nine we have eight people seated, nine, right? nine eight, nine yeah. seated i think it's very important we just got to reach a date in which all nine vote mm -hmm. i don't want i don't want eight because i don't want a four four tie i mean i'm not saying it would happen that way um but i also think it's just important i, I think all of us that are seated we have to own this one way or another so yeah okay should we move on Pete, mm -hmm. Lynn, questions? Not from me. Lynn? No, not right now. Okay, but well, we have a game plan, clearly delineated, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, item number 14, docket number LND CV 19-6120947-S, David Marcato said Al versus Zoning Board of Appeals of the Town of New Canaan at Al pursuant to the memorandum of decision from the Superior Court Judicial District of Hartford dated May 10th, 2021. In accordance with the judge's decision, the matter is to be referred to the Planning and Zoning Commission for its, considerate, for its consideration in accordance with the judge's decision. Um, Pete, brief us, please. Uh, this is a referral from the Zoning Board of Appeals um, because Judge Berger in the land use court, well, let me back up and tell you what this was. This <clears throat> a zoning permit was issued a few years back for some interior work at Grace Farms. Um, and without getting into timelines or anything like that, 
uh, an appeal was taken from that issuance of a zoning permit to the, um, to the ZBA. The ZBA sustained the decision of um, the zoning enforcement officer who was prior to Lynn to um, issue the zoning permit. It was appealed. Judge Berger remanded the case back. Basically, Judge Berger determined that it's really not up to the ZBA to interpret the intent or to determine the intent of the special permit that was issued in 2017 by the Planning and Zoning Commission. So he remanded the case back to the ZBA to ask for the ZBA to ask the PNZ for some help with that issue, basically to uh, give its um, position with respect to the meaning of some of the provisions of the special permit. Um, now tonight, <clears throat> the, the intent tonight is not to discuss it in any substantive way, um, but to push it over to the next meeting because there are other, there is the other parties um, to the litigation and they are the Marquitos' attorney, Amy Suchins, Grace's attorney, uh, Brian Smith, who would probably want to have an opportunity to at least address the commission about this with respect to their feelings. And, um, and that we told them would not be happening tonight. So we don't want to get too far into detail. Um, rather, the hope is that the commission, some of you weren't on the commission in 2017. Um, so you may need to kind of get up to speed a little bit. And during the next month, hopefully uh, you can do that. I'm certainly available and Lynn would be available during that period of time to answer any questions that might come up. Um, and then in, in, at the next meeting, there'd be kind of a, uh, a little more detail and maybe a couple of, I hope, short presentations. It's not gonna be a public hearing. There's, it's not something where the public is gonna be allowed to participate, but simply the parties, the attorneys representing the parties um, could make some statements to the commission if they felt it was appropriate to do. That was sort of something that Judge Berger uh, encouraged. So this is really, um, and just make it a little bit more complicated, there was a second Zoning Board of Appeals decision also involving uh, a zoning permit that was issued that's been put on hold, but your, your, uh, how you interpret the special permit with respect to this case will also sort of, uh, I think, uh, determine how the other case is, um, is decided as well. So, so basically the, the judge has asked the Planning and Zoning Commission to determine whether or not the zoning permits that were issued were within the scope of the special permit or were they in a sense outside the scope of the special permit and something that should have come to the commission as a modification. You recently had a modification of the special permit that came before you with respect to Puddin Hill, I think you, you were all on the commission then. And um, so that's really what the issue is. Should that have, uh, does that need to come back? Do those things need to come back to the commission? Were they within the scope of the special permit? So um, that's all I really wanted to say tonight. And then there'll be a little bit more detail in a month when we come back. Can I ask a Peter question? Uh, is the judge expecting the ZBA to now ask P and Z, what does P and Z, how does P and Z interpret condition six? That's the one about the intensification of use. That's already happened, Dick. Well, Did they've asked, but we haven't told them what. No, no, that's right. That's right. They have asked and but now the ball's in your court. But my question is, does this require the opinion to come from the commissioners that were on the P and Z board at the time of 2017? Well, no, um, it, it's the commission as it now exists. Obviously the members who were on the commission in 2017 are certainly in a better position 
to know what they um, intended intended at the time. Yeah. But um, the commission exists now in its present form. So it's been the, the, the judge's order was uh, for the ZBA to refer the question to the Planning and Zoning Commission. It's up to the commission to determine whose opinion may have more weight or may not have more weight, or everybody's opinion could be the same, or everybody will have the opportunity uh, to determine um, what the what the uh, resolution from 2017 actually means. But Dick, I agree with the, with what you're saying conceptually. It makes sense that, um, but that's not what the judge ordered. So what the judge ordered is sending it back to the commission as it as it currently um, exists. Yeah, to address the question of the application of the conditions of the 2017 permit. Essentially, yes. Yeah, that's, well, those are, those are his words, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, we can do that. Okay, thank you, Pete, appreciate it. Okay, John, no problem. Okay, take care of yourself. You um, too, thanks, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. I, I, item 15, planning subcommittee update. Chris, you got anything for us? Uh, we're looking to have another subcommittee meeting. We didn't want to do it tonight because we knew this was going to be a long one and we didn't want to subject you to any more torture than you're already going through. Um, but maybe when we do the special meeting is what Lynn and I talked about um, in July. So, and, and at that meeting, we hope to really just get the subcommittee to come. I mean, I don't think we're far apart from, you know, coming to a place of recommending the language uh, for inclusionary zoning that we've worked on. That's our hope is to just really hammer that out so that we can bring it as a recommendation to the full commission at the July regular meeting. That's great. Okay, super. I love it. Thank you. Um, uh, Lynn, item 16, admin action. Do you have anything for us? None. Okay. Item 17, approval of minutes. We had a May 25th regular meeting. Do I have motion? Well, does anybody have any changes to those minutes? No. Do I have a motion of approval or denial? Move to approve. Move to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. John Goodwin, I vote yes. John Chris? Yes. Krista Nielsen? Yes. Dan Radman? Yes. Dr. Tornia? Yes. Ann Turner? Yes. Dick Ward? Yes. Arthur Cassavant? Yes. Um, Uh, who did I see who for? Who did I see for Phil? It's, um, James Bash would be voting for Phil. Okay. Okay. So Chris, you're not voting on this one. James Bash? Yes. Okay. Super. Um, June 3rd, special meeting. Any changes to the minutes? Nope. Motion for approval? I'll move again to approve. Okay. Second. 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 Perfect. John Goodwin, I voted wait, yes. Wait, who is the second? There were three of them? Dick Ward. Dick, right. Dick Ward voted, uh, uh, seconded. Okay, sorry. John Goodwin, I vote yes. John Chris? Yes. Krista Nielsen? Yes. Ann Radman? Yes. Claire Discornia? Yes. Ken Turner? Yes. Dick Ward? Yes. Arthur Cassavant? Yes. James Bash? Yes. Okay, super. Um, special thanks to Claire and Dan for dialing in from vacation. Um, enjoy the rest of your vacations. Dan, good luck on beating your wife and getting more fish. <laughs> getting more fish, not what it may have sounded like. Beating your wife sounds questionable. I'm getting in real big trouble here. <laughs> yeah, she, she heard you. Uh-oh. <laughs> Tell Stephanie I'm sorry. <laughs> She's laughing. Okay. Good night, guys. Good night, guys. Good night.